Greetings, everybody. Um, my name is Kathy Breen. I serve in the Maine State Senate, and we are about to kick off a, um, a second round of biennial budget hearings with our colleagues on the Education Committee. Um, we are going to hear this afternoon from numerous cultural institutions in the state, and then also from our higher ed systems. And so um, before we start, I would like to ask Senator Daughtry to lead introductions of the Education Committee. Good afternoon and thank you, Madam Chair. I am Senator Maddie Daughtry. I'm the Senate Chair of the Joint Standing Committee on Education and Cultural Affairs. I also represent Senate District 24, which are the communities of Brunswick, Harpswell, North Yarmouth, Freeport, and Pownall. I'd like to represent my House Chair, Representative Brennan. I think we may have just lost him because he does have a bill in health and human services. So I think he must have gotten the call to hop over there. So up next, we have Senator Rafferty. Thank you, uh, Joe Rafferty, uh, Senate District 34, which is uh, Acton, Lebanon, Berwick, North Berwick, Wells, and Kennebunk. Thank you. And Senator Woodson. Dave Woodson, District 33, Southwestern Maine. Representative Crockett. Did we lose Representative Crockett to the waiting room again? Representative Crockett, you were on mute. Okay. Am I am I in the real room? You're yeah. here. We're, yes. we're, we're welcoming you with open arms. <laughs> okay. Um, well, thanks again. And uh, Ed Crockett, uh, representing District 43, which is part of Portland and Falmouth. Representative Dodge. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon. My name is Jan Dodge. I represent House District 97, Belfast, Northport, and Waldo. Representative Lyman. Good afternoon, Sheila Lyman. I represent District 74, J. Livermore Falls, and Potter Livermore. Representative McRae. Yes, I'm Representative David McRae. I'm up here in the Great White North where the snowmobiling is getting better by the day. Uh, I live in Fort Fairfield and represent District 148. Representative Millett. Good afternoon, I'm Rebecca Millett. I represent House District 30, which is most of Cape Elizabeth. Representative Roach. Good afternoon, I'm Representative Tim Roach, District 7, Wells. And Representative Salisbury. Good afternoon, I am Sue Salisbury and I represent House District 35, which is part of Westbrook. Representative Sampson. Good afternoon, live from Augusta. I'm Representative Heidi Sampson, representing the good people of House District 21, Alfred Limerick Shapley Newfield and Parsons Field. And Representative Stearns. Good afternoon, my name is Paul Stearns. I represent House District 119, which consists of a dozen towns in the unorganized territories of Piscataquis County. Thank you, that's all of us. Thank you, Senator Daughtry, I appreciate that. Um, and uh, now we are gonna introduce members of the Appropriations Committee. Um, so I will start with, um, let's see, uh, Representative Fecto. Good afternoon, I'm Justin Fecto. I represent House District 86, which are the Western and Northern portions of Augusta. Representative Cardone, who's might maybe having a little bit of audio problems, but hopefully Representative Cardone can introduce herself. Hello, I'm Barbara Cardone. I represent House District 127 in Bangor. Uh, Representative Cloutier. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Kristen Cloutier. I represent House District 60, which is part of Lewiston. Representative Arada. Good afternoon, my name is Amy Arada and I represent District 65, which includes New Gloucester and part of Poland. Representative Fay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jessica Fay. I represent House District 66, which is parts of the towns of Casco, Raymond, and the other part of Poland. Representative Corey. Good afternoon, I'm Patrick Corey, I represent House District 25, which is part of Wyndham. 
Representative Hymanson. Good afternoon, Representative Patty Hymanson, representing House District 4, which is parts of York, Wells, Sanford, and Algonquin, keeping the AFA room warm and cozy. Uh, Representative Millett. Good afternoon. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm Soen Millett. I represent House District 71, including the towns of Norway, Sweden, Waterford, and West Paris. Um, Representative Martin. Uh, is Representative Martin with us? Cannot hear him, but um, he might be doing a bill in another committee, so we'll see. Um, and um, let's see, uh, Senator Bailey. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm Senator Donna Bailey, proudly serving the residents of Saco, Old Orchard Beach, Hollis, Lemington, and part of Buxton. Senator Davis. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Paul Davis. I represent Senate District 4, which is all of Piscataquis County and parts of Somerset and Penobscot. And my co-chair, Representative Peirce. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm Teresa Peirce, the House Chair of AFA. I represent the District 44, which is the majority of Falmouth. And I do have to leave and go do a bill, so you may not see me for a little while. Okay. Uh, for folks watching from the public, um, this is the time of year when we are introducing our own bills and other committees. So um, if you see some of us hop off uh, for a little while, um, we'll be back and rest assured that we will be uh, hearing, well, we'll be researching everything that we have submitted. All of your testimony um, will for sure come before us, um, even if we have to read it um, in the future. So um, any questions uh, from any committee members? I also wanna just mention and, and give thanks to um, this good staff, our, our committee analysts and our clerks who are uh, in our IT department who have worked very, very hard behind the scenes to make today happen. And um, they will be ably assisting us as we go along. Um, and lastly, I will be, um, I will be watching, my co-chair will be watching to make sure that folks are muted um, so that we don't uh, inadvertently broadcast things on YouTube um, if we don't mean to. Um, and then lastly, if you have an issue, please <clears throat> don't hesitate to raise your hand um, and uh, doing the raised hand function or if necessary, just call out um, to uh, Madam Chair, and I will stop and, and figure what, out what's going on, if it's a technical problem or anything like that. Um, and I think what we'll do um, is what we did yesterday. So as each one of these organizations presents their testimony, we'll stop and take questions from the committees to those individuals and then uh, let them get on with their day. Um, we are going to have the public, however, wait until we get through um, all of the presentations, and then we will take uh, testimony from the public who are in the waiting room. Any questions before we proceed? Okay. So the first group we have is um, the Cultural Affairs Council. Uh, and the representative here today is um, Peter Merrill, who we know from other contexts, uh, from Main State Housing, but he also serves on the Cultural Affairs Council, I believe. Or So uh, if that's correct, Mr. Merrill, um, I'm gonna unmute, unmute you and invite you to start. Thank you very much, Senator Breen, uh, uh, Representative Peirce, Senator Daughtry. Uh, I am Peter Merrill. Uh, I'm chairman of the uh, Main State Cultural Affairs Council. And I'm speaking uh, briefly on behalf of the uh, line item in the biennial budget. The Main State Cultural Affairs Council was established in 1991 to ensure a coordinated and integrated system of cultural resources programs and projects to ensure the support of the cultural heritage institutions and the activities in the state. Members of the council, you'll hear from this afternoon, the Maine Arts Commission, the Maine Historic Preservation Commission, the Maine Library Commission, the Maine State Museum Commission, the Maine Humanities Council, the Maine Historical Society, and the Maine State Archives. The chair and vice chair of each member serves on the council. The chair of the council is appointed by the governor from among the members of the governing body of, 
of the uh, member agencies and the agency directors as well as the representative of the governor's office serves as uh, ex officio members. Functions of the council are to coordinate budget requests, provide a form for interagency planning, to coordinate communications, to prepare an annual joint report, planning documents for the agencies, to meet with the film commission and the law library and others as, as appropriate, and to administer the New Century Community Program Fund. The New Century Com uh, Community Program Fund was created by the legislature in 1999 preserve the state's historic resources, properties, artifacts, and documents, to expand access to improved educational resources, and to enhance community and economic development through strengthening local cultural resources, including through increased community access to the state's leading cultural institutions. The program is funded with a general fund appropriation and received uh, a while ago uh, proceeds from two bond issues in 2005 and 2007. Each agency has its own budget, as you will hear this afternoon. The council has a general fund appropriation of $39,444. We also have another special revenue line of $65,424. That is unfortunately not cash, but simply a vehicle to allow us to receive uh, donations without going through a financial order up to that amount. These funds help support the agency's efforts. At the Historical Society, the funds are used to support Maine Memory Network, which is a web-based repository of Maine's oral history. At the Humanities Council, the funds are used to support humanity projects at nonprofit organizations statewide. At the State Museum, the funds will be used to support their database platform and hosting, which allows them to get their collections out in front of the public. At the Maine Historical Preservation Commission, they combine the funds with federal funds to enhance their grants program. The archives make small grants to qualifying institutions to help them preserve, organize, and share their archival collections. And the main library utilizes the funds by making grants to libraries to provide community outreach programs. Each of the agencies uses these funds to further support their mission. The council also has a line item for our bicentennial celebration. This is a $500 placeholder to keep the account open. The Bicentennial Commission received two appropriations from the 128th and 129th legislatures totaling $1,075,000. Those funds were run through the council's account. Of that, just over $150,000 remains unspent. Uh, in September, we worked with the budget office to get what was currently needed through a financial order and left what had to be delayed due to COVID for the time being. Members of both committees have been enthusiastic supporters of May's bicentennial effort, and we appreciate that. Attached to my testimony is a copy of the most recent update of the Bicentennial Commission Chairman, Bill Diamond, to the commissioners. It provides a status report on our efforts. For the cultural agencies, these funds are important. The new century amount is small, too small, but critical nevertheless. I think as you listen to each agency describe the work they do, You'll agree with me that they are doing incredibly important work that, although often overlooked, is fundamental to our state and our society. Each of the agencies will discuss the important work that your support allows them to do. Both committees have been very supportive of the council and the cultural agencies. We thank you for that support. Madam Chair. Thank you so much, Mr. Merrill. Um, are you planning to stay as, as the agencies report or um, this was your moment? No, no I, I can stay as long as, as long as you need me until I get my next Zooms. Okay, well, um, are there any questions from either of the committees uh, for Mr. Merrill? If you wouldn't mind doing your raised hand function at the bottom of your screen. Uh, Representative Fay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Merrill. Um, newbie question. Um, the $65,424 um, you had mentioned that you can receive donations up to that amount without financial order. I'm just curious about why the 65,000 and why not some other number in case you had a significant benefactor come along. 
two, two reasons. Did I, I misunderstand? No, no, no. You, you understood exactly right. I had to have somebody explain it to me when I first tripped over it as well. Um, I, I believe it's $65,000 because uh, we inherited that at some point and because uh, as occasional tinkering with the budget things across the board up, across the board down, uh, that's probably why there's uh, 400 and whatever it is in there. Um, and why it's not a much larger number, I suspect if, if uh, we were to receive a million dollar donation from somebody, probably the appropriators would want to know a little bit about it. Uh, Representative Arada has a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so of the money appropriated for the bicentennial, you spent about 1.6 or 7 million. And with everything canceled, I'm just curious what actually, what did the money go for? I know I received a couple of books in the mail. It's uh, very nice, but you're welcome. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm curious, with parades, everything shut down, what, what did we buy? Uh, we bought, we bought a, a staff support for, uh, uh, for quite a while. Um, there were projects that each of the uh, cultural agencies who are about to speak were asked to undertake by the uh, commission. Uh, and uh, there was a, a, you may may or may not be familiar with it, there was a major grants program with three or four rounds of grants to small uh, organizations throughout the state to try and bring the bicentennial out to everybody in, in each small town. And that's where the bulk of the money went. Very successful. We're very proud of that. Okay, thank you. Um, any other questions for Mr. Merrill? Uh, all right, so uh, Mr. Merrill, I would maybe suggest that you hang out in the a waiting room or the attendee room and just listen and you know, if we need you, we'll call on you, but um, otherwise we say thank you. And thank you very much for your time and support. Thank you. Um, so next on our agenda, is the Arts Commission. And um, I am going to try to figure out who in the waiting room is the Arts Commission. I see humanities, I see the library. I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Senator Green? Yes. I should have mentioned this. It, it's my understanding that the Arts Commission cannot be here today and that they are submitting testimony or they have begged uh, uh, to Maureen to be allowed to give testimony uh, quickly after the hearing. Okay, thank you for the heads up. Maureen, is there something more you'd like nope. to say? I was gonna say exactly what Mr. Merrill said. So Great. You, should, you should be getting that at some point in the near future. Thank you. Um, how about the Historic Preservation Commission? Anyone here for that? Oh. There's Mr. Yes. Moni. Moni, yes. Thank well, you for joining us. Senators Breen and Daughtry, uh, Representatives Purse and Brennan, and members of the Joint Standing Committees on Appropriations and Financial Affairs and the Joint Committee on Education and Cultural Affairs. My name is Kirk Moni. I am the director of the Maine Historic Preservation Commission. I'm here today to present testimony in support of those departmental items presented in the FY22-23 biennial budget. The Maine Historic Preservation Commission was established by the legislature in 1971 to implement state policy to preserve the architectural, historic, and environmental heritage of the people of the state and promote the cultural, educational, and economic benefits of these resources. The commission is an independent agency within the executive branch. Its governing body is comprised of 11 members, nine of whom are appointed by the governor and two of whom are ex officio representatives from the Department of Transportation and the Department of Agriculture, Conservation and Forestry. The commission's primary focus is the administration of the program of the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966 in Maine. In carrying out this program, the commission 
reviews and comments on all federally funded, licensed and permitted undertakings in Maine. And we assist the owners of income producing historic buildings to obtain federal and state historic rehabilitation tax credits. The commission nominates buildings, structures, sites, objects, and districts to the National Register of Historic Places. At present, there are over 1,650 listings in Maine, including 190 historic districts. Over 8,800 historic resources are included in these listings. The commission maintains an inventory of the state's historic and archeological resources. The Maine Historic Resources Inventory presently contains over 78,000 records, some 11,000 of which pertain to archeological sites. We administer the Certified Local Government Program, which supports municipal historic preservation programs with technical and financial assistance. At present, 10 municipalities participate in this program. The Commission operates a modest grant program that supports the preservation activities of qualified entities, including nonprofit organizations, municipalities, and state agencies. We are responsible for developing, developing and maintaining a statewide historic preservation plan, which is in the process of being updated for the period 2021 to 2026. In addition to the statewide plan, we provide historic and archeological resource data to municipalities engaged in local comprehensive planning. And the commission provides technical assistance to the public nonprofit organizations and governmental agencies at the local, state, and federal levels, as well as education through lectures and publications. Turning to the budget, the Part A request for the Maine Historic Preservation Commission Historic Commercial Rehabilitation Fund may be found on page A317. The Federal Historic Rehabilitation Tax Credit Program has been in existence since 1976, whereas the state credit has existed in its present form since 2008. In the period from 2016 to 2020, 51 rehabilitation projects in Maine resulted in a total investment of over $206 million. The account is established to receive fees for the certification of projects that qualify for Maine state rehabilitation tax credits. However, the commission has not instituted a fee schedule for the following reasons. One, to date, most of the projects have used the federal credit. Two, the state program rules do not require a separate application and review for projects that seek the federal credit. And three, federal funds support agency staff that administer the federal program. And finally, the level of activity for both the federal and state programs has not reached a volume that requires additional staff. The request for other special revenue allocation is $500 in both FY22 and FY23 and there is no budget initiative for this program. Turning to the Historic Preservation Commission, the, the Part A request for the, for the commission begins on page A318. The baseline budget request continues operations at the current level. The request for general fund appropriation is 393,522 in FY21-22 and $395,713 in FY22-23. The state appropriation funds three full-time positions and all other associated expenses. It provides approximately 70% of the matching funds for Maine's annual federal historic preservation grant. The request for federal expenditures fund allocation is $829,523 in FY21-22 and $839,000 $754 in FY22-23. The account is authorized to have five full-time employees. A minimum of 10% of the annual historic preservation fund grant that the commission receives from the National Park Service must be passed through to certified local governments. The balance supports personal services, all other associated expenses, and when the level of funding permits, the grant program. The request for other special revenue funds allocation is $661,774 in 
in FY21-22 and $671,399 in FY22-23. The special revenue account is authorized to have four full-time positions and 4.231 full-time equivalents, as well as the all other associated expenses. There is one budget initiative for this program. The special revenue account supports a field crew of archeologists that works each summer on projects for the main department of transportation and on occasion other state agencies and entities. Depending on the number and size of the projects, the field crew may increase from four or five staff to 10 or 12 staff, including seasonal and intermittent employees. In addition, the location and duration of the work is variable, as is the timing. Over the past several years, there have been times when the current allocation in the special revenue account has resulted in there being insufficient allotment in a given quarter to cover expenses. This initiative requests an additional $30,000 in allocation to ensure that all other expenses associated with field work can be paid in a timely manner. And turning to the Historic Preservation Revolving Fund, the Part A request for the main Historic Preservation, Historic Preservation Revolving Fund may be found on page A319. The Historic Preservation Revolving Fund program provides funds to qualified nonprofit historic preservation organizations in the state for the purposes of acquiring endangered historic properties of local, state, or national significance. The properties are then marketed to new owners who agree to preserve, rehabilitate, or restore the properties subject to historic preservation easements or covenants held by the qualified nonprofit organization. The request for other special revenue funds allocation for this program is $500 in both FY22 and FY23. And there's no budget initiative for this program. And this concludes my testimony for the Maine Historic Preservation Commission. Thank you for your support and interest in the work that we do. Thank you, Mr. Mone. We appreciate you being with us. Are there any questions uh, from either committee for Mr. Mone before we move on? Any, any questions from anyone? Not seeing any. So uh, thank you again for coming. Thank you all. I appreciate it. Take care now. Bye now. Um, next, we have um, the Maine Historical Society. We have Mr. Bromage joining us, and I think he is already in here. Um, if he would just like to give us a shout out and make yeah. himself known. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi there. Hey there. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks for joining us. You all set to go? Okay, great, thanks. Senator Breen, Representative Peirce, members of the Joint Standing Committee on Appropriation and Financial Affairs. Senator Daughtry, Representative Brennan, members of the Joint Standing Committee on Education and Cultural Affairs. Again, my name is Steve Bromage. I'm the Executive Director of the Maine Historical Society. And I'm here today speaking in support of the Historical Society's item in the biennial budget. Uh, Maine Historical Society was founded in 1822, just two years after Maine became a state and has been collecting, preserving, and promoting research, scholarship, and engagement with Maine history ever since. We too are getting ready to celebrate our bicentennial next year. Uh, we are a private 501c nonprofit whose mission is to preserve and share Maine's story. With headquarters in Portland, MHS includes the Brown Research Library, the MHS Museum, and our Maine Memory Network. The Brown Research Library includes the most comprehensive collection of archival material related to Maine history in the state, and serves researchers, scholars, educators, students, genealogists, the general public, and uh, professionals across many, many fields. Through our research library, MHS supports extensive scholarly and collections activities, which are really the foundation for civic dialogue. MHS publishes the scholarly journal Maine History in partnership with the History Department at the University of Maine. We also host fellowships and scholarly forums and have recently completed major collections care and access initiatives related to our photographic and clothing collections. A lot of the money for these big collections projects comes from federal grants. 
Uh, with funding from the National Endowment for the Humanities, we have just embarked on a major initiative to digitize our proprietors and Northeast boundary collections, which document the settlement and distribution of land in Maine from the 17th through 19th century. These are just kind of fascinating documents that really show how Maine evolved. Um, the MHS Museum offers changing exhibitions and public programs that use Maine history to provide context for issues of contemporary interest. Recent exhibit initiatives explored immigration, veterans issues, Maine's food heritage and economy, and our evolving paper industry. The first of our two major bicentennial exhibitions, Holding Up the Sky, Wabanaki People, Cultural History and Art, which was open to the public throughout 2019, explored 13,000 years of Wabanaki and ex uh, experience and stewardship in Maine. It provided context for the bicentennial by acknowledging that 200 years of statehood is just one part of Maine's history. This year's ex exhibition and program initiative, Begin Again, Reckoning with Intolerance in Maine, will explore how Maine fits into the national dialogue on race and equity. Opening in May it will include an exhibition, digital resources, extensive public programs delivered via Zoom, and educational resources that support remote learning. Our museum also includes the Wadsworth Longfellow House, a national historic uh, landmark and how many people know of us. These resources are complemented by public and education programs that provide educators, students, and the general public with opportunities to learn about Maine history, to connect to their communities, and build uh, a variety of skills. Finally, uh, the Maine Memory Network, our nationally recognized digital museums, museum, empowers Maine communities to share their collections, stories, and perspectives. Maine memory has evolved constantly since its launch in 2001 and serves as a robust platform for a wide range of historical interests and activity. It includes historical content contributed by 200 par 270 partners spread across every corner of Maine, hundreds of online exhibits, curricular resources, something called My Maine Stories, which is a portal that enables any individual in Maine to share their, their Maine story, uh, and Maine History Online, which is a sprawling introduction to Maine. The model behind Maine Memory gives status to local knowledge and expertise and radically expands the perspectives that we can include in the telling of Maine history. So through all these activities, MHS serves approximately 500,000 people each year on our campus through outreach programs and on online. MHS is supported by 15 full-time and 16 part-time staff and a current operating budget of approximately $1.6 million. Our budget is funded by membership, annual fund, earned income, small endowment, and foundation and government grants. In the proposed biennial budget for 2022-23, MHS would receive $44,864 annually from the State of Maine General Fund, or approximately 2.8% of our operating budget. State funds received by Maine Historical Society support the development, maintenance, and outreach services provided through the Maine Memory Network. The annual operating costs for Maine memory are approximately $250,000 per year. In the current year, state funding accounts for about 18% of its operations. Uh, sustaining Maine memory is a free and vital public resource is one of our foremost strategic priorities at MHS, and the state's general fund uh, remains really essential to that sustainability. I just want to take a, a brief mention and reference the bicentennial and the pandemic before I conclude. Um, while uh, clearly, um, as questions have already suggested, while the pandemic fundamentally affected the scale and spirit of Maine's bicentennial commemoration, MHS adapted, uh, was able to continue to provide programming and creative resources that will be permanently accessible. These include a major new bicentennial section of Maine memory, which with extensive information about the statehood process and new curricular resources that MHS created in partnership with teachers around the state and with the Bicentennial Commission. Our second major bicentennial exhibit, State of Mind Becoming, a Maine, uh, Becoming Maine, which just closed a couple weeks ago, um, considered how multiple communities perceived and experienced statehood, including the Wabanaki, African Americans, English speaking, and the Acadian French. MHS also uh, published a bicentennial edition of Ronald Book's classic book, uh, Maine Becomes a State, which provides a play-by-play -play of the statehood process. Uh, we did that in partnership with the Cultural Affairs Commission and the funding for that came from the license plate fund, the Bicentennial License State Plate Fund. Um, we sent, uh, each member of the legislature was sent copies last fall. So I'm 
sorry, I'm feeling remiss that the new legislatures should also get uh, copies for those who might might be new to the legislature, and we could look at that. Mr. Bromage, is this when you're going to do the test on the on the history book? Oh, the test that that would be good. That would be good. Okay. We're better. <laughs> We're ready. There you go. Excellent. Excellent. What state did we separate from? Right. Yeah. Points of pride. Um, yeah, in indeed. And actually, I'd, I'd want everybody to tell their community story. That would be the fun thing to do. Um, so, so finally, with the Bicentennial, we were also able to pivot our Bicentennial programs online. Our Maine at 200 series began in, se in September and will continue through March. Each of the programs in that series is available online now, so you can go back and watch them. And in the next couple of weeks, we're going to wrap it up with uh, great talks by Earl Shettleworth, actually, this Thursday night. And then we have Colin Woodard uh, giving a talk in March that will help bring that home. So, you know, the Bicentennial is not what any of us hoped or expected, but I think um, it's still an important moment as we get through the pandemic to commemorate and celebrate all that makes Maine, Maine. So just uh, quickly to touch base on the pandemic, um, for us, the pandemic has brought both challenges and opportunities. We estimate that MHS will lose approximately $300,000 this year in revenue from admissions, fundraising events, and other sources impacted by the pandemic. We are working hard to replace that revenue, and I think making progress. Uh, Maine CARES funds certainly helped us uh, avoid staff layoffs, so we really appreciate that effort. Along with the challenges though, that I think the pandemic has created opportunities for MHS with people homebound, socially isolated and desperate for connection, information and entertainment. We recognize that MHS was well positioned to shift our focus to the digital realm where we have significant resources and expertise. Um, Maine Memory provided a powerful starting place giving us a digital platform for sharing Maine content including historical context for both the pandemic and all the social equity issues that have been talked about this past year. Um, MHS re received 1.9 million page views from about 500,000 unique users in 2020, which was a 47% increase over the previous year. You know, just again, people home needing uh, digital connection. I think Zoom has also provided a powerful new tool that now enables MHS to reach and serve Mainers around across the state and country. Um, we have produced Zoom programming on topics ranging from the bicentennial to suffrage to social justice issues um, to a broad range of main history topics ranging from railroads to apples. Um, Zoom enabled MHS to triple participation in its public programs in 2020 from about uh, 1,000 people in person in 2019 on our campus to more than 3,000 um, last year with, via Zoom. And I think strategically, if you see us as a Portland organization, you know, we are really committed to the statewide service. Um, so even a year ago, we couldn't have imagined having a tool like Zoom. So this is so important. It's going to be a fun, fundamental part of how we do our programming going forward and the numbers and the, uh, the, the hunger for this kind of content has been really strong. So to conclude, um, we, as we enter 2021, main, MHS is really focused on what comes next, the opportunity and, and need to prepare Maine to thrive in its next century. You know, the, so the questions, what are, dream, what are Mainers dreams for the future? What assets and opportunities will drive a strong economy and create prosperity for people and communities throughout the state? How will we address challenges like climate change and social, economic, and geographic inequity? How will we preserve and strengthen Maine's incredible sense of place? We think history is really essential to that process, and MHS is committed to using its resources to support Mainers' needs today and preparations for the future. Every aspect of Maine today is fundamentally shaped by history. The stories that MHS preserves and shares, the stories of your families and communities, provide a roadmap of how we got here and of what makes Maine, Maine. They provide the context and information needed to unpack challenging legacies and keys that can help us build a vibrant, forward-looking Maine. Thank you so much for your time and the critical uh, funding you provide our, for our work. Uh, it really, we really, really appreciate it. Be happy to ask, answer any questions. Thank you so much, Mr. Bromage. Any questions for the Maine Historical Society? It's so uh, refreshing to hear that you were able to expand so much um, with technology. That's great. Um, okay, I don't see any questions from anybody. So um, I will say thanks again for coming and for all you're doing. Thank you so much. Thanks. Take care. Bye now. Bye-bye. Um, next, we have um, Hayden Anderson, 
from the Maine Humanities Council. So let me bring that person in. And Hello, hello. Hi there, welcome. Thank you, it's great to be here. Senator Breen, Representative Peirce, Senator Daughtry, Representative Brennan, and esteemed members of the committees. My name is Hayden Anderson. I am the executive director of the Maine Humanities Council, and I'm speaking in support of the council's item in the biennial budget. I think it's page A328. The Maine Humanities Council is an independent statewide nonprofit that supports lifelong learning and civic engagement for the people of Maine. We serve as the state affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities and the Library of Congress Center for the Book. We provide educational programs throughout the state, addressing a range of needs, including literacy, promotion of reading, teacher enrichment, community history, increased civic engagement, and cultural tourism. Our constituents include low literacy adults, public school teachers, veterans, domestic violence agencies, prisoners, healthcare workers, library patrons, and general audiences. The council conducts direct programs and also provides matching grants for community cultural activities. All funding received from the state of Maine is distributed as grants to communities throughout the state. These grants offer an avenue for community-based cultural organizations, schools, and libraries to mount public programs on a wide range of local history and other cultural topics. 100% of state funding that comes to the Maine Humanities Council is distributed to communities through matching grants. The council does not retain any of the funds to cover overhead personnel or administrative costs. Grants are awarded through a competitive review conducted by members of the council's volunteer board of directors, and any organization that receives a grant is required to match it at least one-to-one. -one. In effect, the impact of these state funds is doubled. State appropriations to the council is paid out 100% to support the initiative and energy and creativity in communities throughout the state. In the past year, the council has awarded 51 grants through our regular grant making, totaling nearly $79,000. In addition, last spring, the council was called upon to distribute relief grants in Maine, funded by the Federal CARES Act. We distributed $432,000 to 98 different Maine organizations divided equally between the first and second congressional districts and representing all 16 main counties. I've included a list of those CARES Act grants with your handout. I'd invite you to look through it to get a sense of the kinds of community-based organizations we support. These grants are not large, but we have the experience and the know-how to get them to organizations who will make good use of every penny. This funding goes an awfully long way and it makes a big difference in our communities directly reaching Mainers statewide. As you know, this past year has been exceedingly hard on the community-based cultural organizations in the cities and towns of Maine, especially small grassroots organizations. Many are still struggling to survive and some might not make it at all. If the realities of the state budget permit it, I promise you, that any increase to the Maine Humanities Council, if it's $25,000, $50,000, any other amount, that money would be directed in its entirety to Maine organizations in a way that will make a meaningful difference to the communities they serve. I'm awfully grateful for this opportunity to speak to you. I answer any questions that you might have. Thank you very much, Mr. Anderson. Are there any questions for Mr. Anderson and the Maine Humanities Council? Mm, not seeing any. So uh, thank you again very, very much for coming. Thank you all. Thank you for your service. Thank you. Bye now. Um, next is the Main State Library. So I will let in, uh, I will welcome Mr. Ritter and ask him to just give us a quick shout out when he arrives in our panel.
there he is. Up here. I can see all of you. Can you hear me? Yes. Good okay. Time. Thank you. Terrific. Welcome. Thank you very much. Senator Breen and Representative Purse, members of the Committee on Appropriations and Financial Affairs, and Senator Daughtry, Representative Brennan, and members of the Standing Committee on Education and Cultural Affairs. I'm Jamie Ritter. I'm the Maine State Librarian, and I'm speaking in support of our items in the biennial budget. Just a very brief introduction. We were one of the first cultural agencies created by state government back in 1837. And throughout our long history, we've had the privilege and honor of helping people, making Maine libraries stronger and transforming information into knowledge. In 2020, we were certainly challenged Yet we held true to our mission and core values, and we provided leadership through adversity to ensure that our core services continued. We look forward to continue serving the people of Maine, and the allocations represented in this proposed budget will allow us to do so. We are made up of three primary departments, collection and de collection development and digital initiatives, public and outreach services, and library development. And these three departments will be discussed briefly in the context of the budget uh, items submitted. The budget uh, submitted will allow us to carry out our important work and the testimony that follows uh, will underscore the importance of our work and highlight some of the challenges that are in front of us. To go through the budget, uh, corresponding with the way it was submitted, uh, the administration program, this general fund is created to support a role for the main state librarian and the associated administrative costs, such as technology, our central service center costs, and other administrative responsibilities. I'm statutorily responsible for overseeing the operation of the main state library, which includes the three departments previously referenced. And addition, additionally, one of my key roles is uh, working with Network Maine, we are, we are, the State Library is one of four partner, agency partners that delivers the Maine School and Library Network, which brings high speed fiber broadband to nearly 900 schools and libraries across Maine. The next program is the uh, Blind and Visually Impaired News Access Fund. This is a new uh, fund created. It was created uh, from uh, the last legislature it's a special revenue fund that receives its primary source of funding from the main uh, PUC and their portion of uh, the Universal Services Fund. With those monies, we then administer content subscriptions, most notably Newsline, which is provided by the National Federation for the Blind, to ensure that those main citizens who are blind or have visual impairments can access news services 24-7. Uh, we kicked that off last year and renewed again this year, and it's uh, a terrific program. The main public library fund, the next uh, item listed in the budget, again, a special revenue fund was established in 2014. Uh, hopefully many of you are familiar with it. This allows Maine state tax filers to voluntarily contribute to the fund when they file their annual state taxes. Uh, in 2014, we received about $25,000. Now we're over $50,000 annually through these incredible voluntary contributions. These funds are used directly to support Maine public libraries through grants that range from small amounts to up to $5,000. They help uh, all kinds of things for our public libraries, develop community programs, build collections, pilot innovative initiatives, support professional development for librarians, and much more. Since 2014, roughly $300,000 has been granted to Maine's public library. And there's just an example of a robotics club uh, uh, that took place in the Skowhegan Public Library. And um, uh, the grant funded that. And there's a testimony from uh, the parent and whose children participate in that. And I won't read that, but it's part of the written testimony. The Maine State Library Fund, uh, this is the uh, program on page A390. This is our largest primary operating fund consisting of both general fund monies and federal fund monies. It supports the bulk of services delivered um, by the State Library. Again, our three departments uh, are represented through this fund. Collections and Digital Initiatives is responsible for all collection development activities and an extensive digitization effort, including a third round of grant funding to digitize newspapers. We have over 7 million miles of books and materials on the shelves. As you'd expect, many are Maine-based, focusing on Maine history, state government publications, books by Maine authors, 
and a robust nonfiction and genealogy collection. In fact, we do boast the largest collection of genealogical materials north of Boston. We collect all main newspapers that are in print, and we have over 20,000 rolls of microfilm, many, again, for main newspapers, both past and present. This department is also responsible for building digital collections and helping to maintain access to the state's digital library uh, platforms. Excuse me. Our public and outreach services department is quite unique. We offer a public circulating library in the cultural building right across the street from the, the state house. We're open 50 hours per week. And in a traditional year, we can see between 75,000 and 90,000 visitors through the state library. So we're truly a destination for people. As many of you know, uh, the building is getting significant work. We are moving and relocating into a temporary location at 242 State Street. And uh, hopefully in the next month or two, you'll see us open to the public again at this new uh, scaled down location for a couple of years while they work. So um, more to come on that. But the primary purpose of our public operation is to provide services to Maine citizens seeking to access collections, research, reference services, public computing support. Now more than ever, uh, oftentimes you have to schedule um, a COVID, COVID test online or uh, get information online about uh, the COVID vaccine. So, you know, libraries are central to that. In June, um, as a result of the pandemic, we did institute curbside pickup, which allows people to call in and request items from the collection and then pick them up outside. A very uh, a key piece to our public and outreach uh, services are two programs, the Talking Books or the Books for the Blind program and the Books by Mail program. Talking Books lends audiobooks provided by the National Library Service through the Library of Congress, to thousands of eligible Maine citizens. And the Books by Mail program literally mails books to citizens that are homebound or in communities don't, that don't have a public library. Both very important services, especially over the last year, but continuing into the future as well. And the final department served through this program is library development. Uh, we do receive funding uh, directly from the Institute of Museum Library Services, their grants the state's program uh, of roughly 1.3 million in federal funding. And that's really what uh, allows this department to exist. The department is made up of a team of specialists in key areas such as technology or youth literacy or STEM. Uh, all of you approved last, uh, last session are STEM specialists, thank you. These specialists are responsible for working with Maine libraries to ensure they have the tools they need, as well as needed consultation and advice to make these libraries stronger organizations. Additionally, this department helps to support the growth of online and professional development and learning resources through subscriptions available in our digital Maine library. As you might expect, usually these specialists are out visiting in libraries in person, hosting in-person meetings, just like so many other organizations, we pivoted to virtual meetings and programs in order to deliver services. And since March of last year, we've reached nearly 7,000 attendees in the various programs that we have been offering. One is a weekly meeting between librarians across the state just to check in, but others in include professional development or, or learning for students and teachers, such as our STEM education activity, which is held every Wednesday. The highlight of this department's work really in a time of, of COVID and the leadership that, that the staff in this area really showed, we developed a reopening checklist specifically for libraries. And this was included um, as part of the governor's and CDC reopening guidance for public institutions. So libraries across Maine have a specific checklist that they can turn to, to make sure that they're reopening safely um, and looking to see what they need to do to, to meet certain criteria. So suffice it to say, all three core departments of the State Library have thrived over the past year, and we look forward to doing so in the years to come. This fund and the budget has and will continue to support all of these important services. And the final fund in the budget is the Statewide Library Information System. Again, this is a general fund. This provides support to both our digital repository and the digital main library. All three of the main state libraries departments have a role in managing these platforms and content um, that the funds in this program support. 
So to give context to what, what these things are, the platforms and the content, we've added tens of thousands of items into our digital repository, mostly historical items, state government publications. We now host over 170,000 digital documents. Nearly 1.5 million unique downloads have taken place in the last year. And since we've had this repository, nearly 2.5 million downloads have taken place. While most come from Maine, we do know and we can see that people all over the world are accessing our collections. We are also the statewide service hub for getting digital materials from all statewide collecting organizations, library or otherwise, into the Digital Public Library of America. And this just showcases Maine's collections uh, through DPLA, uh, again, to people all over the country and, and the world. And then finally, we're one of the lead organizations for providing content and support for the statewide digital main library, which is a key resource for students and citizens. This library hosts hundreds of subscription based content, which allows people to access millions of digital materials, such as articles, publications, educational data sets, learning tools, et cetera. And then the final thing that I'll say before um, taking any questions, if any, like any organization, we're facing challenges too. Um, we recognize the importance of a fiscally prudent budget. Um, there are certainly unknown economic conditions ahead of us. Um, and we know we can do what we need to do with the budget as presented. Some of our challenges will result, uh, really are identified by um, seeing costs rising on the horizon. So popular digital and online content, cost for these subscriptions is up. We anticipate about a 4% increase, which is an impact of $20,000 20, uh, to our budget in just one year. So FY22, we'd be looking to see that increased cost. Uh, interlibrary loan services. This is where you can live in Portland, go to the Portland Public Library. They don't have the book you need. It's available in Belfast. This Van delivery service shuttles that book from Belfast to Portland um, so that, that a patron there can have that book. We move over 1.6 million materials a year through this service. These costs are going up too. Um, they went up, in fact, on July 1st of the last fiscal budget uh, that was passed as a result of an R RFP. And again, looking to go up this July and the impact in FY22 uh, would be about $10,000. We think we can overcome these, but we're just letting the committee members know um, that that's what is ahead of us. So thank you for your time. I hope I didn't go on too long. We appreciate your support and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Ritter. Uh, Representative Hymanson has her hand up and then Representative Fay. Thank you for preserving all of our important documents. Um, um, I wondered if the collection had any injury from the extensive damage to the building? Thank you. And, and unfortunately, no. We've been very lucky, uh, very lucky. And um, in fact, I really have to hand it to the administration and um, uh, Bureau of General Services, the facilities area, understanding how important our collection is to actually move out of the building while this work is done over the next two years. So the bulk of our collection will be moved to a warehouse in Winthrop. We'll have access to the collection. We can retrieve materials uh, from people who want to use it. And then of course, I mentioned 242 State Street where we'll have a scaled down operation. But no, no damage to the collection and with it out of the building while this work is taking place, um, hopefully pretty, pretty safe there as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Representative Fay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Mr. Ritter. Um, I have been a volunteer at uh, our local library and the interlibrary loan and the van service is a lifeline for the patrons of our very, very small, very undercapitalized uh, local volunteer library. And so um, I, I'm curious if your costs increase for that service, um, do you have plans to pass those costs on to local libraries or how would you absorb that? So th thank you for the question. Um, 
and, and the answer, I'll be, I'll be brief and as concise as I can. It's in a two parts. Um, the way I spoke about the, the increases are the cost that the state library would take on um, because we, we fund one day of delivery per week uh, to a public library. So those are our costs. And at the end of the day, $10,000, we're gonna, we're gonna find the money. We're gonna, we're gonna make it happen. Um, but just given, you know, given our budget, any type of pinch or crunch means something else doesn't get funded, but we'll, we're gonna work through that. The other part to the question is that for any library that receives more than one day of delivery per week, some receive five per week, uh, that 80 cents per day will be passed on to them. That will be a cost that they absorb. So two or more days of delivery for a library, they're going to pick up that, that additional cost and it might mean a library just can't um, afford to do that. Thank you very much. Any other questions for Mr. Ritter? I am not seeing any. So um, thank you for coming and uh, sharing your good work with us today. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Take care, everyone. You too. Um, next, we have um, the Maine State Museum. And that will be Mr. Fishman joining us. So I will um, move Mr. Fishman over from attendee um, to um, panelists, if you would just give us a shout when you arrive. If I can just say that he's in the room, but he's muted and talking. Ah, thank you. I don't see him, but I will go find him. Oh, there he is. Can you unmute yourself now? Yes. So Wonderful. I'm audible, I hope, to everyone. And thank you, Mr. Fishman. Thank you. Um, Senator Breen and Representative Peirce of the Appropriations and Financial Affairs Committee, Senator Dautry and Representative Brennan of the Education and Cultural Affairs Committee and honorable members of each committee. I'm Bernard Fishman, the director of the Maine State Museum. I'm here this afternoon to support and describe those items relating to the Maine State Museum in the proposed biennial budget. Uh, at first though, I'll give you some uh, highlights of what the museum is uh, enduring at the moment. And I'll start by mentioning that for the first time in 50 years, since 1971, when the museum first moved into Augusta's cultural building, the Maine State Museum has been closed to the public. This is not, as I think most of you know, because of the pandemic, but because of the Bureau of General Services ongoing massive capital repair project in the state cultural building intended to entirely replace the structure's failed HVAC systems and remove extensive asbestos remaining from its original construction in the late 1960s. And this project will last at least two more years. The library and the state archives have been displaced into new quarters by this work, and they will reopen in a limited way in the coming months. But shifting the museum with its 40,000 square feet of exhibits and tens of thousands of fragile and irreplaceable objects comprising the most important existing collection of physical materials representing Maine's heritage is a far more complex and difficult undertaking. Several thousand square feet of exhibits are being dismantled by hand and the objects carefully protected and moved, a great problem in itself since the museum has almost no remaining storage capacity. At present, about half of all museum staff time is being devoted to supporting the Bureau of General Services in protecting or moving exhibits, and it will be months before the museum can even move its offices because a sprinkler system first has to be installed in the Hallowell 
collections facility where those offices are intended to be re relocated. This closure has cost the museum all of its earned income, which is about 6% of its combined general fund and special revenue fund budget. And as a state agency, the museum has not been eligible to apply for PPP forgivable loans, employee retention tax credits, or federal supported relief funds, even when those funds are locally administered. So for the museum, it is a time of uncertainty and dislocation, but also of productive work and important planning for the future. There's an, an enormous amount of activity going on internally, despite the locked doors on the outside. Besides the intense work for the building project, which involves hundreds of thousands of dollars of museum staff costs contributed at no charge to the capital improvement project, the museum has developed a range of new online educational programs, such as the Pandemic Primary Source Set, which provides educational materials for teachers and students to learn about pandemics in Maine and the world, structured at age-appropriate levels. And there's a, a, a view of one item from this display in your report. And I hope you are looking at it because this is the first time we've put any illustrations in our report to the legislature. So it's a, a, a bit of a small milestone for us. This and many other uh, educational programs that are new can be found on the museum's website. We do a lot of research and publication at the museum. And here is an example, curator Laureen Labar's encyclopedic study, Maine Quilts, 250 Years of Comfort and Community is about to be co-published by the Maine State Museum and Down East Books. This is the most important or will be the most important uh, source of information on its subject ever produced. This book accompanies an exhibit originally planned for 2021, but now uh, postponed into, until the museum reopens. During this enforced time away from normal museum operations, curators have undertaken a deep dive project to intensify research and documentation for thousands of history objects in the collections. Uh, the museum itself has about 800,000 objects in its collections. This project will have immediate public benefit with new online access to information and images about our collections. And the first group of 400 objects uh, resulting from this intensified documentation will be posted online in the spring. The museum continues to acquire and preserve important highlights of Maine's history. The museum now owns what was perhaps the largest remaining privately owned collection of Civil War materials with the acquisition of the papers on the possessions of Isaac Dyer, a Skowhegan native who commanded the 15th Maine Regiment in the Civil War. And a pair of new items in keeping with the museum's interest in race and justice are photographs of Luther Verrill, who's portrayed at the left on the report, and Clifton Harris, both accused of a brutal murder in Auburn in 1867. In what appears to be a cruel miscarriage of justice, Harris was hanged for the crime, which he almost certainly did not commit, while Verrill was released on a technicality. Harris's was the only execution performed while Joshua Chamberlain was Maine's governor. Some of the most exciting work going on at the museum now involves planning new exhibits. The cultural building project will result in the dismantling of some major exhibits in the museum, which at nearly 40 years old have long outlived their expected lifespans and no longer meet modern museum standards of presentation, educational content, or subject matter. We've long expressed our strategic need to upgrade or replace some of these displays. About 11,000 square feet of exhibits on the museum's third entrance floor will be replaced. There are three exhibit sections in the area to be transformed. One section will become the Lunder Education Center, made possible through a six-year planning and fundraising effort, which the museum has just completed, raising $750,000 in private and institutional donations, in addition to a generous $100,000 legislative appropriation. This project will enable the greatest advance in the museum's educational history and will be aimed especially at expanding learning opportunities for students and families. We've actually begun building this vital addition in small ways, running like voles under the feet of moose as the cultural building project, this huge project, envelops all the space around us. 
Of the other two exhibit sections on the third floor, one will be devoted to Maine's natural history. Our current hope is to be able to install an exhibit featuring two humpback whale skeletons and related exhibits about Maine's coastal communities and economics in the face of climate change. And a schematic drawing of that is illustrated in the report. The other area will be a new Meet Maine Here exhibit, also in the various early, uh, very earliest planning stages now. We'll be holding a series of community meetings soon throughout the state to gather more information about how we should develop what will be this museum's new welcoming face and outstretched hand, greeting thousands of visitors when we reopen. Intensive planning and considerable fundraising will be required to fully realize these two yet unplanned exhibit areas. Years of effort will be required, but the result will be something spectacular and a source of pride in Maine for all of us. And now we'll move from the thrilling visions of the museum's possible future to the unforgiving essential budget realities of the present. The first budget program. Please look at page A412 of your budget, Maine State Museum 0180. Here is the baseline general fund budget for the museum's operations. The budget for the FY22-23 biennium differs little from that of the last one. This budget includes personal services for the salaries and benefits of the museum's current staff of 20 full-time equivalent positions, as well as one budget initiative I will mention shortly. The FY22-23 budget also includes a $204,366 allotment for all other, the non-personal services costs available to the museum through the general fund. As an aside, I'll mention that the museum raises meaningful sums each year outside of the general fund in the range of 15 to 20% of its total expenses to augment costs for education, for collections preservation and documentation, for exhibits, supplies, minor equipment, and small infrastructure projects. This income has dropped recently with the loss of admission revenues, fees, and museum store income and contributions. And these losses mean the museum will have less income for supporting collection and educational expenses as we go forward. The museum itself was uh, begun in 1836 with displays in the State House. And in 1965, it became an autonomous unit of state government charged in law with the important task of educating Mainers and visitors about the state's history and heritage including its heritage in nature and natural science. We probably have the largest natural science related collections in Maine. The law also requires that the museum maintain the high standards of full museum professionalism. And so we have worked hard and successfully to become one among the only 3% of American museums that are nationally accredited. To achieve this level of competence, the museum must direct substantial funds to the largely behind the scene work of preserving its collections, as well as the more visible labor of using these collections for educational purposes. In more normal times, the museum spent about 35% of its resources on collections preservation, about 30% on visitor and educational services, and about 20% on exhibit planning and installation. Under present circumstances, as we've uh, mentioned, we're spending even more on collection related, related projects and protection related to the BGS building project. The museum's main tasks are the collection and preservation of physical materials representing Maine's cultural and natural history and the interpretation and use of these materials for specific educational purposes, as well as for intelligent and engaging entertainment. The museum also has considerable responsibility the considerable responsibility of managing the State House Portrait Collection, the State House Flag Collection, and the historical collections in the Blaine House. In normal times, the museum is also heavily involved in scheduling public tours for the State House, Blaine House, and of course, the museum itself. In its last full year of operation, the museum had about 45,000 on site visitors, including 15,000 students in structured programs the largest number of student visitors to any Maine museum. Some 200 Maine communities, most from rural or small town areas, were represented by these visits. The reach of the museum is truly statewide 
and we present state government, I think, in one of the most uh, happy and beneficial ways available. We have only one initiative in this budget that's found on A413. It represents a fund reduction proposal remaining from the governor's earlier, earlier requirement that state agencies produce a plan to reduce costs in the face of the pandemic emergency. It involves the reclassification of one museum specialist three position to a museum specialist two position. It is not an action the museum would take in the absence of an emergency, but it was certainly preferable to having to consider the possible loss of a staff position. Though we did have to lay off some part-time staff in connection with the um, museum shop out of a separate budget uh, as a result of the closure of the museum. In this case, the staff museum, I've been, the staff member I've been in referring to is the museum registrar who has the vital job of preparing and managing all records concerning the museum collections. This action would require that the museum file the request with the Bureau of Human Resources. Other special revenue funds. These are shown under the Maine State Museum Program on page A413 and include allocations for the museum sales program revolving fund and the Maine State Museum Endowment for Publishing. The former is an account that in normal times receives income from, main, from the museum store sales and makes expenditures in order to operate the store. The latter receives proceeds from a small endowment funded by museum store profits to fund museum and educational publications. The second uh, budget program can be found on page A414 this account holds income from museum admit admissions. When fully open, the museum gave half of its on-site visitors free admissions, including all educational groups, veterans, and others. And the museum price for individual ad admissions was quite low, either two or $3, depending on age, even lower per person for family groups. It was a welcome if modest source of income and raised about $34,000 annually. These funds are used for a small percentage of one museum educator's salary and a variety of museum programs, educational materials, printing and advertising. While a small source of income and an uncertain source now in view of the museum's current closure, this revenue line is maintained in view of possible future attendance or admissions income. And some funds for this line can be drawn from what remains of last year's saved admissions revenue as necessary. However small such sums are important for an institution that has no regular funds at all for public informational or marketing services. We have a third budget program, research and collections that's shown on page A415. It contains two accounts. One holds competitive federal grant awards of which the museum is presently completing one. We will earn others during the course of the biennium. The figure of about $130,000 is an estimate of what we might receive and expend annually from federal grants during the next biennium. The second account with a proposed allocation, a bit more than $168,000, functions similarly but holds donations from individuals along with corporate foundation and other competitively awarded grants for specific projects. The museum is presently raising such funds from a variety of sources and so this figure too represents an estimate of what the fund might hold and expend annually during the com coming biennium. Though of course, current conditions make all such estimates even less certain than usual. Thank you for your attention. There are 45 state museums in the United States and the main state museum is among the smallest. The budgets of most other state museums would not fail to impress you. But the main state museum is the only state museum in New England and it is the oldest state museum of them all. I'm grateful that in consideration of Maine's excellent and historic reputation for financial care and frugality, that it has so devotedly and dependably supported this museum, even with sometimes necessary and sometimes painful ups and downs over the past 56 years since it became an established and statutory part of state government. It shows that state pride and the appearance and the appreciation of public museum education are alive and well in Maine. Our museum is truly a people's museum and is a beloved Maine institution, bringing pleasure and promise to literally millions of people. And as I've already said, I believe it helps that the museum 
uh, shows state government at something uh, of its best. It reaches out to all of our whole population with resources for engagement and the promise of knowledge as well as fund. Uh, speaking personally, it is a joy and a privilege to work for such a stimulating and significant place. It's only the simple truth to say that the museum would probably not exist and would certainly not be, be what we have become without the state support that in various forms has sustained us for nearly two centuries. I suspect that legislators don't get said thank you to very often, but to you and your predecessors, the museum and the people of Maine owe a great deal of gratitude. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Fishman. Um, I see that Representative Hamps, uh, Sampson has a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Fishman. I have a quick question for you. Uh, it's not very difficult. It, so as a former marine um, biologist and somebody that actually would make these displays, how come you have decided to have two humpback whale displays um, skeletons and not two different types of whales? Well, um... One is a uh, juvenile and one is a mother. And while they are not actually related, they can demonstrate the way these whales uh, appear in the natural environment. We are of course dependent on what whales are available through OSHA and other entities. Whale skeletons are difficult to preserve. Uh, they're easily damaged. And these two are available, they're in good condition and they can show the interaction uh, of the species as it propagates itself. Uh, it will look very impressive indeed. Well, they are impressive, yes. I used to actually, that's what I used to do years ago, but um, that's very interesting. And um, thank you for that information. We may be in touch with you when we are farther along in developing these exhibits. Yeah, well, I haven't exactly been doing that lately. I'm doing something <laughs> else. <laughs> uh, any other questions for Mr. Fishman from any committee members? Okay, not seeing any. We wish you the best with your uh, continuing capital improvements. We hope that goes smoothly. Thank, Thank you very Thank much. You coming. Um, now we have folks from um, public, the Maine Public Broadcasting Corporation. I know um, Mr. Vogelzang is uh, going to join us. And once you get here, Mr. Vogelzang, I'm going to ask you if you have any staff with you that I should also let in. So when you um, get into the panel, if you would not, if you would give us a um, shout out, that would be great. So we know where you are. I'll turn on my audio. Wonderful, there you are. Yes, uh, my colleague Claire Hannon is also on deck. Both of us okay. are going to be presenting yeah. today. Um, if you wouldn't mind holding on, I'll, I'll move her over to panelist as well. I sure will. And I have one question for the committee legis uh, sure. uh, technically on that's if there is a way to share screen. We have a map we'd like to s share if that's possible. Um. Or have you decided not to do that with this particular hearing? We have decided not to do that, but um, if it's something that you could email us, then we would have that um, yes, you, at our disposal. Um, it's, al it's already on, um, Senator, it's already been sent in your materials okay. in advance. So it, it well, what I'll try like to do then a is great big that. map of Maine with a lot of towers on it. I will try to get it in the chat. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, are we ready to begin? Is uh, audio and video okay? Yes, and Ms. Hannon is here. Hello, yes, Claire. hi. Hi, Mark. We are uh, delighted to be here today, and uh, thank you. Good afternoon, Senator Breen, Representative Pierce, and the committee members. It's good to see so many familiar faces and friends uh, today. Thank you for the opportunity to briefly share Maine Public's request for support from the legislature for our ongoing broadcast infrastructure of public television and radio. 
As I uh, mentioned on, on screen, I'm Mark Vogelsang, President. Claire Hannon is our Vice President and Chief Operating Officer of Maine Public. Claire? Thank you. Thank you, Mark. And thanks to all of you for your time today. We will present our biennial budget request. It reflects public broadcasting's critical role in the Emergency Alert System, or the EAS, in partnership with Maine Emergency Management Agency, the Maine Association of Broadcasters, and the hundreds of thousands of citizens and households and Maine who watch and listen each week and depend on the 24 seven service of Maine public. We are uh, interested in sharing a little bit more about uh, the history of Maine public. It's an independent nonprofit public broadcaster that was formed, many of you know this, but some don't, in 1992 through the merger of the University of Maine's public TV and radio network and the Colby Bates Bowdoin Colleges public TV channel 10 television station. At the time of the consolidation of the two institutions and the network became an independent entity, the state of Maine took on the responsibility through state statute of providing the ongoing financial support to pay for the infrastructure costs of operating what was then five television stations and seven FM radio stations. We have a, a large statewide infrastructure and the ongoing yearly operating costs um, total 3.2 million and it's for our power transmission and maintenance for these 24 seven signals that are, are at over 30 tower sites across Maine. The actual costs far exceed the direct support provided by our, our annual appropriation, uh, which is currently at 1.6 5 million, and it is a helpful increase that we've gotten recently in this appropriation after 10 years of declining funding. We're grateful for that and a challenging funding year for the state. However, it is approximately half of the necessary funds that we need to operate the statewide network. The remaining costs for transmission are paid for out of our programming and operations budget for Maine Public, which is commuted, provided by the community in the form of donors and underwriters. And I'm sure for those of you who listen and, and watch, you are familiar with our pledge drives. It's a big part of what we do in public broadcasting. Um, so we're grateful for all of that support. We do respectfully request the, the legislature and in both you, uh, uh, on our committees of representation, continue in your progress towards providing that full funding that is required um, of $3.2 million. We'd like to share for a moment the work that Maine Public has done over the past year during the pandemic. And of course, uh, it's affected everyone. And it's a simple message. Maine Public has been incredibly appreciated during COVID by the people of Maine. Uh, and we weren't sure about that, but the exceptional programming on radio and television and digital when all of us have been homebound and our lives disrupted. And also during this time, not only have we been appreciated, but we've stepped up and delivered more content than ever before. And we're reaching more Mainers than ever before in our history over the past year, as some of our earlier panelists have talked about. Over 400,000 households on television tune in each week. And nearly 250,000 individuals listen to the stations of Maine Public Radio each week, by far and away the largest radio network in the state of any commercial or non-commercial operations. In spite of the lockdowns and quarantines that we've all had to experience, Maine Public has, has been and continues to be a connection point for news, like the regular broadcasts of our CDC briefings, the reporting on COVID both nationally and regionally. From the PBS NewsHour to NPR News and Morning Edition on radio, the news is an unprecedented election year. It's all been a trusted source of independent journalism for all of us. As listeners and view viewers have shared with us, public broadcasting is where Mainers can turn for the in-depth local reporting, national reporting, and international reporting. It's a place for reliable information and trusted independent news where the facts matter. And Maine Public has also been a connection point for information, where we've all been hungry for discussions about what's actually happening in the state. Claire mentioned the CDC briefings. Maine Calling every weekday morning at 11 o'clock is a place on the radio where thousands of Mainers are tuning in to gain a deeper understanding of everything from the elections to the best books to read, or directly talking to our governor or elected officials and asking them questions. 
Maine Public has also been a connection point for music, which has been a lovely uh, respite from the, the dissonance and chaos of, of the churning news cycle. We have 24 hours of classical music on the radio for homebound folks, and it provides beauty, companionship, and solace on our network of Maine Public Classical. And we reach over 50,000 people who tune in every week. Maine Public has also been a connection point for education. And this is something that not a lot of us think about when we think about public television or radio. But in education, our teams launched a service last spring on television called The Learning Space for grade school kids at home, grades three through five. In partnership with the Department of Education Leadership and Educate Maine, we brought Maine Teachers of the Year who created their own videos and we broadcast them on statewide public television into homes where there was limited internet access. And the amazing thing is that each episode reached on average 1,800 kids who tuned in. And that's the equivalent of 90 main classrooms each day on television watching these episodes. On the financial side, we were fortunate to receive PPP monies that helped us keep our staff and organization working with no furloughs or layoffs, even as there was tremendous uncertainty over our funding and our fundraising. That sense of stability was helped through additional federal support through the CARES Act, where the Corporation for Public Broadcasting was able to provide financial support of just under, four, under 450000 in our last fiscal year to our statewide radio and television network. Again, that was an important safety net during the uncertain time of COVID and declining revenues on our underwriting side. Even as our staff of nearly 100 professionals were dispersed and working from home and adverse conditions in the field and figuring out how to do remote broadcasting for our programs and hosts. So listeners and viewers continue to have service uninterrupted. At this point, I'd normally share the map of our network. And if those of you have it uh, in your materials, it's worth taking a quick peek at. Maine Public, repeating a little bit of what, we, what we've said before, is a key partner with Maine Emergency Management Agency. And Representative Millett, you remember this and uh, others as the primary broadcast network in the emergency alert system, the EAS, whose distinctive tones are essential in the case of public safety, adverse weather, or national emergencies from the president or governor. That EAS infrastructure is built into our broadcast network and all 30 of those towers and network transmitters. And we monitor and test it 24 seven as required by law from our multiple network locations. You know, Maine is an interesting, wonderful state. We serve both rural and urban communities as a partner like we always has from the very top in Fort Fairfield and the Allagash all the way down to Sanford and Kittery and into New Hampshire and into Canada but it remains both expensive and technically challenging to keep these five TV stations and 14 now FM radio broadcast transmitters op operational. When we include the transmission links, that's nearly 30 sites that we operate far away from the general public. Most people don't see where we broadcast from, but they have to be on the air every single day. The dollars that come from the state appropriation are used for these purposes and these purposes only, electricity, fuel, maintenance, and more to keep these signals available to every Mainer. Winters are tough, and summer is tough as well. The programming costs that you use, that we see uh, when we broadcast TV or radio programs, are exclusive of state monies, and those programming costs are supported from the listeners and viewers and underwriters and by the federal dollars of the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. So as we wrap up, thank you for your time today. We'd be happy to answer any questions you may have about Maine Public uh, on the technical side, on the financial side, on the programming side, and of course, our statewide radio and television service to the people of Maine. Thank you very much. I, I was able to get your testimony into the chat with uh, directions to scroll down to the end for the map. So folks Great. on the committees do have access to that. Um, Great. Glad, it, glad that happened. Um, so, um, are there any questions from either committee for the good folks of Maine Public? Uh, not seeing any at this moment. Let me just check again. No, don't see any. Well, we're delighted to have been here today. Claire and I love what we do and we're grateful for all the people who support public broadcasting, including the legislature, and we thank you for that. 
Thank you all. Thank you very much for coming. We really appreciate everything you're doing. See ya. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye now. Um, so we uh, are at the point where we have finished with the um, cultural institutions and we're gonna turn now to the high, higher ed systems. Um, I consulted with my co-chair co about taking a break, but we decided we, we were gonna charge ahead. So if anybody needs to uh, take a break, obviously you can turn off your screen and your microphone and go ahead and do that. Um, so uh, without further ado, um, we have in the following order, community college system, Maine Maritime and Academy, and then the UMaine system. So um, I'm gonna admit uh, President Daigler, and then when he gets here, see if he has uh, some staff people who he brought. So um, President Daigler, when you get here, just give us a shout out so we can find you. Uh, Senator Breen, I am here. Um, Pam Ramirez will join me to address any questions you might have. Okay. I'm also here. Oh, wonderful. Thank you both. Um, and we're, we have your video too. So um, go right ahead. The floor is yours. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, let me just take a second to get myself um, organized here. Take your Thank time. You. We know how that feels. Yes, no problem. Okay, I'm good. Senator Breen, Representative Peirce, members of the Joint Standing Committee on Appropriations and Financial Affairs. Senator Doherty, Representative Brennan, and members of the Joint Standing Committee on Education and Cultural Affairs. I'm David Dagler, the president of the Maine Community College System. I thank you for, my patience, for your patience while I was getting started, and I thank you for taking time with me to allow me to present this budget request on behalf of the trustees of the Maine Community College System. The MCCS budget we are discussing is on page A94 in part A of the general fund budget. I understand that the Criminal Justice Committee will be considering a standalone bill that will sustain funding for, will propose to sustain funding for the live fire service training facilities that you find on page A93. MCCS serves as the financial administrator for those funds, but they're managed by the fire chiefs and I'm not actually testifying on that line today. Maine's seven community colleges have long been the most direct, affordable, effective, an efficient investment for, a meaningful, for meaningfully advancing Maine's economy. Our fall enrollment was about 16,000 students, and we serve a total of 29,000 individuals through degree programs, customized training, credit and non-credit offerings. We educate Maine people for all walks of life to provide them the skills they need for a stable and rewarding life. The state's financial support that we're discussing today allows us to educate tomorrow's workforce in critical, innovative, high demand fields that will sustain and strengthen the fabric of our society as we go forward. Now, the economist in me wants to present to you a very thorough analysis of how this recession differs from those in the past. But the administrator in me knows that we are short on time, so I will be brief. There are two differences I do wanna point out between this recession and those in the most recent century. First, this recession has had a much greater impact on people with the lowest earning potential. I wanna repeat that. This recession has had a much greater impact on people with the lowest earning potential. The written testimony that you have includes a graph that shows just how profound this difference is. Those of us with degrees and marketable skills, we're figuring it out. We can work remotely, and honestly, we're the lucky ones. People in the service industries, Mainers making minimum wage, have been hit extremely hard by this pandemic and the recession that's come with it. In many cases, their old jobs are not coming back. They need a fresh start. The second difference, in past recessions, community colleges saw increases in enrollment. That's not the case this time. Our traditional students had to prioritize the work they could find 
and they could not risk losing that job. They had to care for kids. They had to worry about aging parents. They were overwhelmed and facing financial, medical, and emotional hurdles. Adding school on top of that was too daunting. On the other side, Maine has done a good job of controlling COVID-19. Our vaccine numbers look good and our transmission rates were very low. I believe we're poised for a V-shaped recession that has Maine leading the pack and as the rest of the country begins to recover. So amid the chaos and crisis of this craziness, there's an opportunity if we choose to seize it. Now, last October, we presented our budget request to the administration. We requested a 3% increase in our baseline for each year of the biennium. As you know, most of our budget goes to personnel and our people have performed admirably during, during this pandemic. We also asked for $7.5 million in our incredibly successful, successful Maine Quality Center programs. You will note that the budget before you does not recommend the 3% increase or the additional money for the Maine Quality Centers. We fully understand and appreciate why the governor did not include these funds in her biennial proposal. She had an obligation to present you with a balanced budget with the information she had available at that time. However, we do believe that additional appropriations are crucial in order for all Mainers to benefit in this economic recovery. And we respectfully ask as new financial scenarios unfold that you consider MCCS and everything we have to offer. The biennial budget is about looking forward and I'm excited about the future. My optimism is built on the accomplishments of the past year. When it came clear that COVID would shut down our campuses last spring, the faculty and staff at MCCS worked around the clock to make sure that students could finish their spring courses with safe, albeit remote, instruction. Um, our college has also donated protective equipment and respirators to medical partners. They supported soup kitchens and made sure our food pantries stayed open. When it became clear that the fall would not be a return to normal, those same faculty pivoted again with robust, high quality online learning environments. They didn't miss a beat. Before the pandemic, um, the vast majority of our courses were taught in a hands-on manner. With COVID, that has been reversed. To protect the hands-on learning that can only occur on campus, whether it be baking a souffle, fixing a Ford 150, drawing blood, or welding pipes, we had to shift about 70% of our classroom instruction to remote learning. There was no this was no simple effort. It took time and it took money. We also reduced the capacity in our residence halls so that each student had their own room. We needed to make these choices to keep our campuses and our communities as safe as possible. You may wonder why we did not take an approach similar to our sister institutions in higher education and stand up a robust testing regimen. Under advice from public health officials, we determined that since most of our students move between home and class and work, COVID tests would be invalid within hours. It just didn't make financial sense. Instead, we paired a screening app with staff follow-up to find and assist anyone in the college community who might be in contact with or have contracted COVID-19. I'm gonna knock on wood here, but I will report today that to date, we have not had a single instance of on-campus transmission. We remain vigilant and we hope that continues throughout the semester. From a financial perspective, the costs have been huge, but we've used federal funding wisely to mitigate many of those expenses. That aid meant some, but not all of the costs we've incurred. Between the two federal aid packages, MCCS has received about $28.7 million. 8.7 of that was directed to, to student emergency aid and 20 million is being used to support institutional costs related to COVID-19. There are pie charts included in the packets that we distributed that show the outlay of both the CARES and CRISA funding to date. We're very proud of the work our faculty and staff have done to maintain our high standards and our level of excellence. A flat budget paired with the fiscal constraints caused by COVID-19 will not allow us to compensate our staff 
and may result in layoffs. Those are the hardworking people who stood by our students during this entire pandemic. We are the state's training partner, and we ask you to partner with us to assure that we have the resources needed to continue to work with Maine's businesses and rebuild a better, safer, stronger economy. If there was ever a need for additional evidence that the community colleges could respond quickly, efficiently, and effectively, our response to the pandemic has demonstrated that we're incredibly nimble and we respond very fast. We are in constant talks with the Maine health, uh, with Maine's healthcare industry about how we can support their hiring needs. The allied health professions represent our largest group of academic programs. I hope you've seen that, that um, the news that our nursing, three of our nursing programs were ranked in the top 10 in the state. We also developed a uh, needed pipeline of educators. When the Department of Education needed, uh, needed, when the Department of Education identified a need for people trained to work in classrooms, supporting certified K-12 teachers who had to be remote for health reasons, our innovative faculty at Eastern Maine Community College created the Learning Facilitator Program. They designed that program so it had a lasting value. The people trained as learning facilitators have the credentials needed to qualify as ed techs in the post-pandemic classroom. We also worked with the Maine Indoor Air Quality Council to create, to create the recently launched HVAC badge for municipal and state and school personnel. People earning that badge will know how to make sure that the air quality is up to speed and that, that our public buildings are as safe as possible not spreading the virus to adjacent rooms. The main quality centers are, tr are free uh, to the trainee and they lead directly to an existing job. State statute requires that they have a, an ROI of three years. I am proud to tell you that wage growth from the program participants returns funding to the state in well under three years. Our trainees get good, robust paying jobs. I'm sure you've heard of the Puritan medical story. Becky has sent you a link to a short video about our involvement in that program. But let me tell you, on May 1st, May 1st, we received a call from Puritan and they needed to train um, employees for their new production facility. Before the summer ended, we had 350 workers fully trained and ready to make swabs necessary for COVID-19 testing. We responded in weeks, not months or years. When Hospitality Maine reached out and asked us to provide COVID-19 safety training for the food service and lodging staff, we ramped up four online training programs. To date, almost 3,500 hospitality workers have COVID readiness badges, adding to Maine's brand as a safe place to live or visit, and that brand is paying dividends. Our quality center programs train people in hospitality, healthcare, manufacturing, education in Maine's forest and on Maine's coast. Now lastly, but certainly not least, with the right investments, we can provide the workforce needed to install and maintain the equipment needed to build Maine's green economy. We need technicians that can work on electric cars. We need 450 journey electricians to install solar panels. We need 100,000 heat pumps installed by qualified personnel. If we invest in Maine's workforce, invest in Maine's workforce, that's a need that was articulated in the 10-year economic plan and by the Economic Recovery Committee, we can move Maine forward. But we need your help. As we look forward, please recognize that Maine has an opportunity and a choice. Do we train the 33,000 unemployed for vacant positions that are going unfilled? Do we find new ways to get the 30,000 people who have left the workforce altogether and get them the skills they need so that they can be productive in this economy? Do we help our manufacturing partners by building a workforce needed to fill the orders that, are, that they are currently turning away? Do we build a green workforce for a sustainable environment? Do we support our children in the K-12 system? Do we fill virtually thousands of vacancies that exist right now in hospitals and senior care facilities? 
Do we support Maine businesses that are anxious to recover from this pandemic? Do we put Mainers on the path to a new career and away from a life of poverty? I hope you can see a clear choice. I thank you and I'm open for questions that you may have. Thank you very much, President Daigler. And I wanna thank you also for the briefing sessions that you did over the summer for the 129th. Um, those were very helpful, keeping us all in the loop. They, so, they were my pleasure, Senator Reem, thank, thank you. you. Um, it looks like Representative Arada has a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, of the, so you have 70% uh, remote learning. Um, so when do you plan to go back to mostly in-person learning? What, what metrics do you need to have in order to make that decision? Um, the metrics are education and the course of the virus and the course of the vaccine. Um, I think we will increase, I think, emphasize think there, that, I th that we will increase face-to-face -face instruction this fall but I don't think we will be back to the kind of um, delivery models that we had before we left the pan before the pandemic started. Um, so you don't have a specific percentage of vac vaccine vaccinated students or faculty. You don't have specific numbers. No, and and, and frankly, um, I'm in touch with higher ed, higher ed institutions around the state and actually around the country. We are all trying to answer those questions and trying to find um, what is really the right balance. Um, also, um, both the science is a little unclear and what's really unclear is the pace at which the vaccine gets out and, and um, the number of people that accept the vaccine and the immunity rates that go with it. So we are aiming for increased um, in-person instruction it's clear that our students crave that personal hands-on approach. Um, it's also clear that our students move very, you know, dynamically from the, from the community onto the campus, into their workforce and back into their home, and that they could be massive spreaders. And so, um, so we will continue to work with that. Um, the, app, the, the, hand, the app that goes with the um, smartphones has been incredibly resourceful in terms of identifying um, spreading potential before it gets to campus. And so we've been also been able to be laser focused about the programs that could be impacted and taking corrective measures with them. Okay, thank you very much. Um, just real quick, is, is this decision ultimately yours to make or is it up to the main CDC or the governor? Or do you collaborate? With we, I, I, I think the best answer to that is really a, a notion of collaboration. Um, we have not had a situation where we've challenged whose decision it is. We work very closely with the public health officials. We work very closely with the CDC. We work very closely with the administration. And then we work very closely with our colleagues in higher education. And we try and identify the model that is going to best serve our students. But the model that best serves the students is making sure that faculty and staff are safe and that they can deliver the education and services that, that are necessary. And so that really forms the basis for our decisions. Thank you very much. Any other questions for President Daigler and the Maine Community College system? Representative Peirce. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Chair Breen. I just want to echo uh, your comments about um, how informed that the uh, Maine Community College system kept us over the course of the pandemic, appreciated your outreach and also your quick and uh, uh, nimble way in which you dealt with a lot of situations in order to really meet need across the state. I think it was very impressive and uh, you were always there if we called and uh, happy to provide information. So I, I commend uh, the entire uh, system on that. It really was an amazing job and want to thank you for that. Well, I thank you. I'm going to pass that on because truthfully, it's just you know my honor to work with some pretty outstanding people who were very responsive and, and everyone had their heart in the right place and that was taking care of those students. So but thank you and I'll pass that on. So any other uh, questions for President Daigler? Representative McRae. This isn't even a question. Uh, recently, I, I completed my second second uh, vaccination at, at NMCC. And I need to say that there, in concert with the organizations 
making the appointments. I got there uh, and I almost, it was almost a continuous walk until I came out the other end. It was so well organized. The facility was perfect. The volunteers were great. The staff was great. And uh, I know all of the old people in Aroostook County very much appreciated it. Thank you. Thank you. It was, I'll, I'll pass that on as well. Um, the CDC, the public health officials, the, the hospitals that administered the vaccine are all part of a huge planning process to pull that off. And the college was happy to, to be part of it. Okay. Any other um, questions for uh, President Daigler? Not seeing any. Um, uh, Thank you very much, President Daigler. Thank you. Senator Ms. Breen, Re Representative uh, Hammonson may oh, have had his hand up. Uh, thank you. Representative Hammonson. Thank you. Um, you mentioned that if money were to come available that um, you would like for us to circle back to you. Do you have a shovel ready kind of budget that um, anticipates more funding if that were to happen? Yes. Okay, that's all I need to know. Just preparedness is everything. So I appreciate that answer. Thank you. Any other questions for President Daigler? Uh, Representative Millette. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, feeding off of that line in President Daigler, um, it would be great if we could see that shovel ready. Uh, we will, we will do that. We actually have um, several program initiatives and it's really scaled to the amount of money that's available, but we will get that to you. Wonderful, thank you. Any other questions for President Daigler? Okay, thank you again for coming and thanks for your patience. Um, a bit of a long afternoon, but we appreciate you being here. Thank you for your time. And um, next we have uh, the folks from Maine Maritime Academy. So that would be um, Mr. Brennan and Mr. Rosen. Um, I hope Mr. Rosen came prepared with some treats for the Appropriations Committee. And um, with that, I will let them both in. One, or maybe they already are in. Oh, there's Mr. Brennan. And is Mr. Rosen with us yet? Yes, I'm in. Wonderful, there he is. All right, um, Mr. Brennan, would you like to begin? Thank you uh, for the opportunity to be here today, Senators Bream and Daughtry, Representative Purse and Brennan and members of both committees. I've provided the committees with copies of my testimony and so in the interest of time, I'll summarize that. And as you've already pointed out, and I'm pleased to uh, acknowledge that Richard Rosen, our Vice President for Financial and Institutional Services is joining me today. In my past appearances before you, I've told you that we are a focused STEM institution offering a very specialized program to study in engineering, management, science, and transportation prescribed by the US Maritime Administration in the United States Coast Guard. And Maine Maritime Academy is unique because we are one of only six such state colleges in the country that offer this specialized program of study. The very nature of our federally required program for the majority of our students is referred to as competency-based demonstration of knowledge, which means that our students must demonstrate their ability in person to perform elements of their training in order to receive the US Coast Guard licenses they pursue. This cannot be done online. And for this reason, MMA is at a significant disadvantage in meeting the challenges presented by COVID-19. To date, the impacts of COVID-19 upon our FY21 budget is 15%. MMA experienced a 6% decline in enrollment, operating revenue from core mission services, including tuition, fees, and auxiliary categories like room and board and conferences declined by 13%. This year, revenue losses and COVID-19 expenses result in a $6 million negative impact to our $41 million budget. The Academy has received emergency one-time federal funding assistance through the CARES Act and from the Coronavirus Relief Fund administered by the state of Maine. 
While we are grateful for state and federal assistance, the best form of achieving financial recovery for this public institution is to ensure that every Maine student who desires to enroll as a student at Maine Maritime Academy can find the means to make it so. Renewal of, our, of, of your commitment to support our mission will bear much fruit. We are developing and revising plans for the balance of this semester as we go along, including plans for the required training cruises aboard our 500 foot training ship. But we know that the cost of operation will be greater as we've had new expenses for acquisition of sufficient personal protective equipment for all students, faculty and staff. And this includes COVID-19 testing of personnel and students. To sum the impact of COVID-19 pandemic to the Maine Maritime Academy would pale in comparison to the dollar amounts impacting our much larger colleagues in the public higher education partnership in Maine. But we operate on a much narrower margin and the impacts upon us are profound and threatened aspects of our existence. As I mentioned at the outset, Maine Maritime Academy is one of only six state such colleges in the country. All of my competitors, however, offer lower tuition than I can because they receive significant support from their respective states. California Maritime received 66% of its operating revenue from the state. Massachusetts Maritime receives 43% of its budget from the state and SUNY Maritime College receives 54% of its operations budget in the form of state appropriation. The state of Maine's contribution to our operating expenses has declined over time from as much as 50% of the total 20 years ago to 22.4% of the total or 9 million now. And the measure you are considering today, if approved, would bring us back to FY 2017 levels of state assistance. Should a strategic commitment be made to increase and maintain state support for Maine Maritime Academy, I suggest a biannual goal of funding a minimum of level of 25% of total revenue from the state baseline appropriation. If resources become available, I also request the restoration of funding associated with the cost of living adjustments for academy personnel, a restoration of regular funding for repairs, upgrades and capital improvements to facilities including the infrastructure bond funding for critical repairs to our aging central dormitory that was left hanging when the last legislature had to abandon its session due to the threat of the pandemic. We at Maine Maritime Academy, the faculty, staff, and certainly our students are appreciative of your efforts to help us address some of the obstacles we've confronted in the past, but we now face a much different landscape. I'm a realist and I know that there are serious needs that, you, that will press upon you and I simply ask that you give this very unique and iconic institution fair and equitable consideration as you address spending priorities. I wanna thank you for your time and consideration regarding the recommended biennial funding for the Academy. And Richard and I would be happy to attempt to answer any of the questions you have at this time or later during the committee's work session. Thank you very much. I stand ready to respond to any questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Brennan. And thank you, Mr. Rosen for being here. Are there any questions from the committee members um, for um, the folks from the Maritime Academy? Um, not seeing any. If you do have some, uh, please raise your hand in the- uh, Senator Millet has a question. Let's Senator say. Millet, or, uh, Representative Millet, thank you. Thank you. Um, I would just pose the same question to Dr. Brennan. Um, if you would please just provide us with what that amount would be to, to make you whole um, for the coming biennium. That'd be great. Thank you. Certainly. Any other questions for the Maine Maritime folks? Okay, not seeing any. Uh, thank you both for coming. We really appreciate all you're doing. and. Um, Look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you, and I wish you well with uh, your challenges. <laughs> Thank you. Um, last, but very, very far from least, uh, we have the University of Maine system. Um, we have 
Chancellor Malloy, as well as Dr. Farini Mundi, who's the president. And um, I'm gonna welcome them over to the panel side. If you could just give us a uh, little shout when you get here, that would be helpful so we can find you. This is uh, Joan Freeney Mundy. I'm here now. Welcome. Thank you. And Chancellor, have you joined us? Um, if Chancellor Malloy is on, I cannot hear you. I see your picture, but you're on mute. Okay, can you can you hear me now? I can hear you. Would you like to turn on your camera? Or are you are you going to stick with your photo? Uh, uh, hopefully, the camera will come on. It uh, should be coming on at any rate. Uh, why don't I start, and we'll see whether we can straighten out that little problem. Sounds good. Uh, the co-host. Uh, okay, so we'll uh, just give it. It just showed up. There we go. There we go. Thank you. Uh, Senators Breen and Daughtry and Representatives Purse and Brennan uh, and distinguished members of the uh, uh, committees, uh, thank you for allowing uh, me to address you today uh, and present uh, uh, ourselves in support of what the governor has uh, sent to you uh, in her biennial budget um, uh, for uh, the public universities of the state of Maine. Uh, we are, after all, the largest driver of social mobility, economic recovery, and innovation for the future uh, in the state of Maine. I would like to begin by saying one year ago, I actually stood before you, uh, uh, many of you, uh, at a supplemental budget hearing, warning of the challenges uh, that a flat fiscal year 21 appropriation created for our universities, especially then given uh, our additional $11.5 million in collectively bargained personnel cost and our commitment to Maine students and their families to limit tuition increases to the rate of inflation. At the time, our system had begun planning for the novel coronavirus that had just closed all the schools in Japan, but we never could have ima imagined the devastation the pandemic uh, would inflict on the American people uh, or the global economy. Uh, or so that uh, so many people would continue to be suffering to this date. And may I add that our hearts go out to those who have lost a loved one uh, in this epic battle against COVID-19. Since Maine's first positive case in mid-March, uh, the system has incurred more than $100 million in COVID-related revenue losses and new expenses. Let me repeat, that's $100 million. This includes $27 million for testing and tracing costs, $26.8 million in lost room and board revenue, in part because of occupancy limitations, $30 million in research uh, um, redirection and downtime, $5 million in state curtailment and slot revenue reductions as reflected on page A491 of the budget document, and millions more for pandemic pay, PPE, and unbudgeted technology upgrades to support remote and hybrid instruction. Thanks to the leadership of Maine's congressional delegation and the governor, we have been fortunate uh, that some of the costs uh, have been offset by the federal uh, aid that has come directly to our universities from the US Department of Education or through the Mills administration uh, 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 contributions as well. But the $39.2 million in total relief to date falls far short of our significant needs. Even if the president's American Rescue Plan passes as proposed, the financial impact of the pandemic to our system this year will still be equal to the combined operating budgets of the University of Maine at Fort Kent, Machias, Presque Isle, and the School of Law. This does not account for further losses uh, if we are unable to open with normal capacity and conditions this coming fall. Thanks to prudent fiscal management and relatively stable enrollment in recent years, we have so far, so far not passed any of these COVID costs onto our students, nearly half of whom are the first in their families to attend college. 
In fact, to keep quality higher education affordable and accessible for all Mainers, including displaced adults, we've made a record $95 million in financial aid available this year in small part using the funds provided through the license plate sales and slot machine proceeds, including in the initiative on page A491. And expanded, pro and, and expanded programs that raise aspirations and rates of degree completion and reduce debt, like, the, like early college. And we have continued to honor our con contractual commitments to all of our 4,700 employees who, like our students, have demonstrated remarkable resilience throughout the pandemic. The flat pre curtailment uh, fiscal year 21 level appropriation for our systems, educational and general activities proposed on page uh, A488 of the governor's, of Governor Mills budget protects our public institutions from deeper financial harm and preserves the state lo state's longstanding strategic investments in its largest educational research enterprise. We urge you to join the governor in supporting a budget that recognizes the role of our universities in advancing opportunity for all Maine people and accelerating, accelerating economic recovery. But I must be clear, while fat, flat funding instead of the deep cuts we've, we, were, we were initially warned of um, will ease our financial challenges, it does not solve them. As we enter a new round of labor negotiations with our six bargaining units and our trustees prepare to set tuition rates for the 2021-22 academic year, we must be honest with you and our campus uh, communities about the difficult decisions ahead. Over the last decade, our state appropriation has increased on average less than 1% uh, year, year over year. And like uh, our tuition rates uh, have actually, during a time in which our um, tuition rates have actually decreased when adjusted for inflation. At the same time, the compensation costs that account for more than two thirds of our operating expenses have steadily risen with our full-time faculty, for example, receiving annual increases of between 1.5 and 3% each year. This revenue expense balance is simply not sustainable, especially given our physical plants $1 billion backlog in deferred maintenance and, and imminent need that uh, must be addressed to meet federal accessibility requirements and basic health and safety standards, let alone actually be competitive in attracting the best and the brightest students available. As the legislature prioritizes investments that will yield the greatest return for Maine's future um, uh, and sustain, uh, uh, to be sustained, I would argue growing funding for public university education and research must be paramount. Whether you look at the 10-year state strategic plan or the Economic Recovery Committee's recommendations, the path to pr prosperity for Maine and its people starts with bold investments in talent development to prepare Mainers for high demand, good paying jobs, and in commercially promising research and innovation that leverages key sectors of strength like our natural resource-based uh, resource industries. And there is data su to support this. In the first six months of the pandemic, employment among Maine's low wage workers who typically, to, who typically uh, lack a post-secondary or credential fell by 27.6% while employment among middle and high wage workers actually increased with high wage professionals who usually have a four year or advanced degree seeing double digit ri ri rise in employment. Just last week, a study was released showing that the University of Maine alumni pay 49% more state income tax than the statewide average and consistent with the 10 year plans uh, goal uh, growing wages by 10%, the median income of workers, working age Black Bear alumni is more than double the state's overall median income. In the last decade, our universities have conferred 55,800, excuse me, 55,982 degrees with the greatest number of graduates in fields that directly strengthen our communities and our economy, led by nursing and health professions, business, education, and engineering. I often say that while you could have been working in higher education for any length of time over the past century and never have encountered a global pandemic, I was lucky enough to experience one in my first year. Uh, and I really mean that in some senses at least. 
While the financial fallout has been unlike anything our universities have ever faced, so too has the oppor opportunity presented by the pandemic to show the people of Maine the positive impact our institutions have on their lives. From our initial decision last March to close our campuses to the, um, to the vaccinations, our nursing students are voluntarily administering at this very minute in your communities. We have acted uh, with the best interest of Maine in mind and have guided and have been guided by science. Our universities have put students and employees first. We were among the first in the nation to reimburse our students pro rata room and board charges, which we did within, within two weeks of the closure of our residence halls to the tune of $12.8 million. Uh, $12 million. We were also among the first to distribute federal CARES emergency aid, sending direct payments of, of as much as $675 to more than 20,000 students within days of receiving those dollars from the federal government. We maintained pay and benefit stability for both regular and student workers, and to ensure we could provide high Im impact in-person instruction and meet basic needs like food and housing while keeping uh, students, employees, and the public safe. We stood up an aggressive uh, uh, asymptomatic uh, testing operation, administering some 75,000 COVID tests to date and maintaining a positivity rate, which is well below Maine's, making our campuses among the safest, safest places to be. This has allowed us to remain open for students and research activities to support highly dependent local economies and to hold the line um, with respect to enrollment. While we were supporting the success of our students, whose uh, course completion rate was on par or even better in some cases to pre-COVID semesters, thanks to the extraordinary efforts uh, of our students, faculty, and staff, we were stepping up, our, we were step, stepping up to uniquely serve the state. I hope you are already aware of our contributions to Maine communities throughout the state's emergency but I'd like to take a minute to remind you of just a few of the many ways we made a difference. Um, our universities I made that difference. We produced thousands of gallons of hand sanitizer for Maine's hospitals and healthcare organizations in partnership with local breweries and distillers and chemicals used by National Guard to, uh, to fit the uh, N95 masks to, to test them, field test them, uh, were also produced. We turned hundreds of schools and library parking lots into Wi-Fi hotspots and upgraded 300 uh, pl plus pre-K through 12 schools to high-speed connections to support remote and hybrid learning. We converted gymnasiums into 24-7 shelters for those experience experiencing homelessness in the COVID crisis. We helped CDC stand up its contact tracing program and, condu and conduct uh, outbreak investigations. We provided technical assistance to hundreds of business uh, persons uh, from uh, kelp farmers to large manufacturers to, to pivot to new production and new markets and navigate new regulation and aid. We represented legal aid clients virtually to obtain, to obtain life-saving protection from abuse orders and deployed uh, hundreds of nursing students to staff virus, hot, virus hotspots and now to administer COVID vaccines at sites across the state. As a system of public universities, we have a public service met mission. Uh, and the examples I've just shared show what we have done for Maine's citizens, companies, and communities when they needed us most. These actions were possible only because of decades of past state investment by you and your predecessors, including in the research enterprise uh, that was so cr uh, critical to much of our services. For this reason, I again urge you to sustain our funding, including for the Maine Economic Improvement Fund, page A489, uh, which our research university president, Joan Farini Mundy, will testify about next. Amidst the most historic year, we achieved two other incredible milestones. We, we became accredited as a system, unifying the previously separate institutional accredit accreditations of the public uh, universities that together make up our system. 
allowing us to better share academic and other resources across our institution for the benefit of all students and the state. And we secure the largest ever philanthropic investment in public institutions of higher education in New England when the Harold Alfon Foundation committed $240 million over a dozen years to help transform our ability to meet Maine's most pressing higher education, workforce, and economic needs. I know some will consider it unwise for me to mention a gift of this magnitude in the same breath that I am imploring you to maintain our appropriation. I should be clear that the Alfond Award cannot be used for normal ENG operations. It was, however, a recognition that no organization is more central to Maine's success uh, at this critical moment than the University of Maine's system. Uh, and particularly our engineering, computing and information sciences and graduate and professional programs that integrate law, business and public health policy. The Alfon funds, which require a dollar for dollar match from public and private sources, do not supplement uh, state appropriations are, and are in fact only possible because of it. Uh, I would uh, address debt service on page A488 and part uh, PPP. The legislative past investment, including the flat debt service initiative on the top of page A488, used to support revenue bonds for a number of projects, including the Furland Engineering Education and Design Center, now under construction at UMaine, positioned us for a generous Alfon gift. Public investment in the future will be critical to our ability to leverage it fully. It is also in large part why we are asking uh, you for the language uh, change in part PPP to clarify that any UMS borrowing uh, for which the debt service is being paid by an external party like the legislature or Alfon Foundation does not count against our statutory limit, which we acknowledge was raised two years ago. We look forward to discussing this in detail with you uh, at the work session. But it, but it is most important for you to know that the system issued debt is not backed by the full faith and credit of the state of Maine. Last year, S&P affirmed our AA minus rating uh, and stable outlook for UMS revenue bonds, allowing us to borrow a, at a highly competitive rate. The agency noted the strength of our pandemic response uh, and our enrollment outlook uh, uh, for reasons uh, to so rate us. I also want to touch on the Casco Bay Estuary Project, page uh, A487, uh, and draw your attention to that last item. Um, it is a, a, a reference, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, it can be found, as I said, on por, uh, page 487. Uh, there is no proposed increase in funding for Casco Bay Estuary Project, a cooperative effort within the University of Southern Maine's Muskie School to protect and restore water quality and fish and wildlife habitat at uh, Ca Casco Bay uh, and uh, its watershed while ensuring comparable uh, human activities. This program is of great importance to the environment and economic vitality of the watershed, which encompasses 41 municipalities and 985 shoreline miles. Its director was among two dozen scientific experts from our system that informed a development of the main climate action plan, another of the many ways we can we add uh, value to the state. I want to close by thanking you for your partnership uh, with the University of Maine system, which has made possible the activities and accomplishments of the past year. Uh, and uh, we uh, look forward to responding uh, to uh, the state citizenry need uh, on an ongoing basis. And we stand ready at this time to answer your questions. Thank you very much, Chancellor Malloy. And um, I know that President Farini Mundi is with us. Does she have some opening remarks as well or um, were you going to take questions right away? I was. I, I, I'm happy to have her uh, speak if she's available to us. If not, I, I thought she was going to be brought in afterwards. But either way is fine. Um, uh, President Freeney Mundy, why don't you go ahead? Okay. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Senators Breen and Daughtry, Representatives Person Brennan, and distinguished members of the Joint Standing Committees on Appropriations and Financial Affairs and Education and Cultural Affairs. I'm Joan farini Mundy. I'm the president of the University of Maine and our regional campus, the University of Maine at Machias. I'm here today to speak in the strongest support 
of the appropriation for the Maine Economic Improvement Fund, known as MEIF, that you will find on page A489 of the governor's biennial budget proposal. MEIF was established by the legislature, this legislature, in 1997. It's the state's, the state's largest direct investment in public university research, development, and commercialization that matters to Maine. In fiscal 20, the state's $17.35 million, $17 million MEIF investment was leveraged at a rate of more than five to one by the hard work of University of Maine system faculty, staff, and students to support the work of 1,221 students and 575 researchers and technicians. They secured 76 patents and provided direct support to more than 300 large, small, and startup businesses in the state of Maine. Much of that activity happened at the University of Maine, which has a long history of strong statewide connections to companies and to communities. We are the public research university in a state whose economy relies very heavily on small businesses, businesses that often lack the internal capacity for new product and process development capacity that's essential to their success. So the University of Maine plays a role in serving those functions for their uh, new product and process development. Some of you may have been present at a University of Maine system legislative briefing in December, and we heard there from Wyman's, which is a 146 year old Washington County company that is growing jobs down east and market share nationally. They're able to do that by working with UMaine's cooperative extension researchers and students who help them and other growers evaluate tools and technologies to improve crop yield. They are also able to do this by working with the scientists at the food pilot plant on our Orono campus on product innovations that add value to Maine's important wild blueberry um, production. MEIF has been flat funded since fiscal 16. And again, there is no new initiative for this program in the proposed budget. However, the MEIF funding and the R&D that it fosters have never been more important to Maine's public and economic health. Much of the university's rapid response in the state's fight against the global pandemic, which you've heard from Chancellor Malloy, from hand sanitizer production in partnership with the craft distilleries to helping major manufacturers pivot to the production of PPE, was possible only because the past MEIF investment accumulating over years and the infrastructure that it put in place were there and were ready to support our state. So we're all very grateful that this funding has continued. There are hundreds of main businesses and healthcare partners who could not have weathered this terrible storm had it not been for the MEIF supported laboratories and centers and the MEIF supported researchers, including our students who stepped up to serve the state. The availability of effective COVID-19 vaccines, which were developed with unprecedented speed and in coordination among government and private and public laboratories is a powerful reminder of the importance that sustained investment in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics nationally and for our young people in Maine is vital to our future. Building on the work of Maine's 10-year economic development strategy and the Economic Recovery Committee's recommendations to grow Maine's post-pandemic economy, um, those are all focused recommendations, just like MEIF on innovation, entrepreneurship, and talent development and attraction. The ERC identified several high potential industries, including seafood and agricultural product processing, forest products, bioproducts and renewable energy, and agile manufacturing that could be further catalyzed with bolder investment in public-private partnerships, the kind that MEIF can support. Those same industries happen to be tied to areas of tremendous strength at UMaine. Our research development and commercialization activity is directly supporting strategic adaptation for the future through the integration of science and new technologies that include artificial intelligence and our demonstrated leadership in engineering, advanced materials, composites, and climate research. Your ongoing appropriation for MEIF is an important foundation to implementing the ERC's recommendations and the university is a vital partner. It will allow all of our universities to continue to respond, partner, and lead in creating solutions to Maine's challenges while fully realizing its opportunities. And I can't remind you enough how central this work is for our students. It gives them the experience of feeling that they can make a difference for their state as undergraduates and graduate students. They're at the center of our research activity, gaining practical experience and problem-solving skills, 
and you are helping through MEIF to develop the next generation knowledge and innovation workforce to fill key leadership positions and attract new businesses to the state. However, as the latest measures of growth report flags, the lack of increasing investment in R&D is one of the greatest hindrances to Maine's prosperity. Maine ranks in the bottom five of all US states for total R&D expenditures, including those by industry and in universities. Just 0.8% of our GDP goes toward R&D. The New England average, for example, is 4.4%. These lagging investments do limit growth and opportunity, not just for Mainers and employers here, but also for our, our state's overall economic prosperity because a robust R&D infrastructure can actually be an attractor for new companies and for expansion of existing companies. And uh, the R&D expenditures are directly tied to the leading indicators of a state's economic health, which also include wages, prices, and productivity. I wanna thank the legislature for its tremendous vision in creating the MEIF almost 25 years ago and for your continued support in the years since. While our biomedical and chemical engineers were able to figure out the formula for hospital grade hand sanitizer and get it into hospitals in Bangor and Lewiston within 24 hours, I know it can sometimes seem that our university-based research and development work takes a long time to realize a return for Maine, but it always does realize that return. Take the incredible work that you know well of Habib Dagger and his team at our world-class Advanced Structures and Composites Center, where they are engineering the floating technologies that can harness the strong coastal winds off of our deep waters. After more than a decade in development, this past year, that project attracted $100 million in private investment to Maine. Or consider the caribou russet, a new potato that took years for our researchers to breed, but is easy to grow, produces high yields and tastes great mashed, fried, or baked. As these examples and certainly the pandemic have proven, the investments that you are making now in MEIF will pay dividends far into the future. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you and I'll be happy to participate in the questions. Thank you very much, President Farini Mundi. And thank you, Chancellor Malloy uh, for standing by. Um, I know that um, Ryan Lowe is here from the Humane System. Um, I imagine that Mr. Lowe is here to answer questions if they come up. Is there, yeah, I got the thumbs up, okay. Um, so we have Representative Arata ready for a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, what percentage of your classes right now are in person and how do you, um, how will you determine when to open all of your classes to in-person instruction? Any of you? Um, Chancellor, you're still on mute. It, ver it varies from, uh, thank you. It varies from campus to campus. There, so there is some uh, a difference, but it is about a 50-50 split with respect to in-classroom learning opportunities or laboratory opportunities. Um, um, and uh, we're actually quite proud of, of having reached that number. Um, I think it's substantially better than many other public universities, uh, universities freestanding or systems uh, in New England. Uh, with respect to the fall, if I can follow up with that, I, I, I personally expect that we'll be in a position uh, to uh, return to a more normal approach. Um, I look forward to that opportunity. I have to say that the advances with, vac with respect to uh, vaccination are, uh, have been uh, uh, demonstrably better uh, over the uh, uh, recent time, and so I'm hopeful uh, that will uh, get to the point where immunity is far more widespread uh, in the community of Maine and quite frankly in our nation, uh, which would invite us to have more regular uh, operations. Uh, we'll have some decisions to make with respect to um, how many students we accommodate uh, in our uh, housing, uh, but those remain to be made, um, as well as a final plan for the fall uh, as we uh, watch literally on a day-by-day -day basis the progress is being made. Okay, thank you. Any more questions for um, Dr. Farini Mundi or for Chancellor Malloy? Um, Representative Fay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I like potatoes a lot, and I was wondering where 
one can purchase caribou russet potatoes because I haven't been able to find them in my local market. So I know that I've been able to find them in Hannaford, but I will find out more for you, Representative Faye, and get back to you. Thank you very much, President Freeney Money. But, but I want to be clear, we're not, uh, we're not uh, endorsing one provider versus another. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm sure there are more. I'm no sure there favoritism, are more. No favors for legislators. <laughs> it's all above board. We're all pro potato, I think we can. <laughs> yeah. uh, Representative McRae. Yes, Representative Faye. Uh, come to the county. Yeah. All right. Um, any other questions for the folks from the Humane System? Um, I want to repeat what I said to uh, President Daigler. I really appreciated the updates that the system provided to the legislature over the summer and fall while we were not in session. Um, I can't say that I attended every one of them, or but um, I know that I speak for many that we really appreciated the outreach and the update and um, your uh, being proactive about keeping us in the loop. Thank you. Um, any further, any questions for the humane folks? All right. Well, thank you again for joining us and um, we will let you sign off. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there are some folks in attendance still who I believe might be here uh, to offer public testimony. Let me just check in with Mandy or Maureen. Could uh, some of you give me, one of you give me some advice on that? I see there are still six people in the waiting room. Some of them have already spoken and are hanging out and listening. Here comes Maureen. Hello, Mandy. Hello, uh, Madam Chair, I believe you have a list of those who were hoping to speak from the public. And, um, and so if you can match those names, I think had Mandy emailed that or perhaps she perhaps. can get you. <laughs> we can just really quickly, are there, Mandy may be able to- I, I can off print off a copy and bring it into you real but, quick if you'd like that. It appears that um, Ms. Sophie Wilson perhaps is a Okay, she's on our list. Okay, why don't we start with Ms. Wilson and Mandy, if you could slip a note under my door with the other names, that would be great. Or, okay. or Madam Chair, you could just ask Mandy to let them in as they, you know, from her list, either way. That's a little confusing to me. I would prefer to get a, a list. Thank you. So I'm going to move Ms. Wilson over to the um, panel. And Ms. Wilson, if you could just give us a shout when you arrive so we can find you in our squares, that would be great. There she is. Welcome. Thank you. Thank uh, you for waiting. We really appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. Senator Breen, Senators Breen and Daughtry, Representatives Pierce and Brennan, and distinguished members of the Joint Standing Committees on Appropriations and Financial Affairs and Education and Cultural Affairs, I'm Sophie Wilson, and I'm joining you today in my official capacity as the town manager for the town of Orono to offer testimony in support of LD 221, specifically as it relates to Governor Mills' proposed appropriation to fund the University of Maine system. The town of Orono is honored to host the University of Maine. As you can imagine, the heart and soul of Orono's local economy is driven by what happens at the system's flagship campus. UMaine significantly contributes to Orono's workforce and customer base and fosters a vibrancy and diversity that makes Orono meaningfully unique. Investment in UMaine provides an economic boost and much needed stability for Orono, the Bangor region and across our state. Together, we've built strong collaborative relationships aimed at supporting local government bringing much needed economic growth to the region, providing hands-on student learning opportunities and finding workable solutions to real life problems. This past year has certainly been a challenge as we've learned to adapt. However, our response to the pandemic is illustrative of our many partnership outcomes. 
Maine's very deliberate, UMaine's very deliberate science-based and collaborative approach to bringing students back to campus, including nearly 5,000 to off-campus community-based housing has been instrumental in keeping Orono safe and, our, and protecting our local economy. We've seen UMaine successfully harness the enthusiasm, creativity, and intellect from campus to truly make a positive impact on our community and across the state. As an example, we're partnering with Dr. Jean McRae and Dr. Robert Wheeler to study the viral load of the COVID SARS-2 virus in wastewater. The information gleaned from these tests predates the data received from state officials regarding local transmission rates. At the first spike in the viral load, we worked together to push out safety messaging to mitigate the risk of further outbreak in our community. While the science is fascinating, the underlying mission is to create a test for wastewater systems to help focus public health education and response efforts. As a two-time graduate, I will attest to the fact that my time at the University of Maine allowed me to ex excel professionally. As town manager, I see UMaine's thoughtful efforts to foster safe, welcoming, and vibrant communities. I've also seen the negative impacts that budget cuts have had on campus, in our community, and to UMaine's ability to provide leadership and technical support to towns throughout the state. Continued support of the University of Maine system is incredibly important as it is an investment in our youth, encourages entrepreneurship that drives the economy, and supports Maine cities and towns. There's no doubt that life will bring a variety of challenges to our doorstep. In Orono, we are poised to face these challenges head on because of our partnership with UMaine. Thank you for your time and consideration as you work through your budget process. Thank you very much, Ms. Wilson. Um, are there any questions for Ms. Wilson, town manager of Orono? I am not seeing any. So uh, thank you again for coming and thank you for your patience. Um, so next we are gonna have um, David Glidden. I will let him in, in in a minute. And Mr. Glidden, when you come in, just uh, give us a little shout so we can find you in our squares. That would be great. Hello, am I here? You are. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Well, Senators Breen and Daughtry, Representatives Purse and Brennan, and distinguished members of the Committees on Appropriations and Financial Affairs and Education and Cultural Affairs. My name is David Glidden, and I'm a secondary education major at the University of Maine at Machias from Cutler, Maine. I'm here to speak in support of sustaining funding for the University of Maine system as proposed in the state budget. I'd like to thank the UMaine system and your committees for giving me an opportunity to speak today. Living in Down East Maine is a mark of pride worn by many of its residents. Part of the reason for that is because of the general understanding that making a living and surviving here can be a real challenge. As many of you well know and understand, the challenges here have only been exacerbated by the pandemic. However, I would like to tell everyone here about how the University of Maine at Machias, which is now a regional campus of the University of Maine, has not only been a great boon to our region, but also a crucial beacon of hope for me personally. I'm a first generation uh, non-traditional student at UMM, and like many in my area, a major stumbling block in the way of higher education is the fear of cost. After being displaced from the lobster fishing industry, which has taken some serious hits in recent years, I found myself in a troubling predicament. I have a family uh, of five that largely depends on me so for support, which meant that I had to make a swift decision about what my future and that of my family would look like. In my search for a sustainable career, I kept coming up short of solid, stable employment. I never really considered college 
because I assumed that there was no way I would be able to pay for it. But fortunately for me, in my own backyard, there was an affordable option, which when discovered was a welcome life ring of rescue for my struggle. Currently I'm pursuing a degree in secondary education where I'll be able to pour back into my community everything that the University of Maine Machias has helped me achieve. It wasn't long into my college career that COVID-19 struck. I was very worried that my newfound ray of hope would quickly be eclipsed by the tiny body of a virus. It became clear to me that my fears were greatly unfounded. My professors worked with urgency and diligence to fundamentally transform their classes to work in a remote format. Meanwhile, I wanted to do more during the pandemic to help my community and use what I was learning at the University of Maine Machias to give back. I applied to my local elementary school, Bay Ridge Elementary, and I got a position as a long-term eighth grade sub with the same responsibilities as a teacher, even though I do not have my teaching certificate yet. I take very seriously my responsibility as an educator of the kids in my community, but I am still in school myself, or because I'm still in school myself, I uniquely understand what they're going through. And I've developed tools to adapt to my own remote hybrid and in-person learning with the help of my University of Maine Machias professors that I can in turn share with my own students so they too can be successful during this difficult time. One of the things that my professors at UMM have taught me is how important it is for educators to model the correct attitudes in the classrooms. Whether there's an attitude towards learning or diversity or an attitude towards public health and safety, I'm thankful that the faculty and staff at UMM and throughout the UMaine system have modeled great enthusiasm for me as a student and commitment to my success. I want them, you, to know just how much having access to affordable higher education close to home means to me. Without UMM, I do not know if my dream of having a stable, sustainable career for which higher education is necessary would ever be achieved. I believe that my story represents those of so many students, young and old, here in Down East Maine. I urge you to support funding for the University of Maine system so that tens of thousands of other students like me can realize our dreams of higher education and opportunity in our great state. Thank you, and I look forward to any questions that you might have. Mr. Glidden, thank you so much for making yourself available today and sharing how you and your family and uh, your community is weathering this uh, pandemic. It's very inspiring. Um, are there any questions for Mr. Glidden from any of the members of the committee? I don't see any, um, but um, I know I speak for many when I say, please keep up the good work and thank you for all you're doing. Thank you. Uh, so next we have um, Katrina Ray Solis. And um, if Ms. Ray Solis, again, could, could uh, just give us a little bit of a shout out when you arrive so we can find your square, that would be great. Hello. Hello. How's it going? Good. Thank you for waiting and hanging in there with us. Yeah, well, I'm in my sewing room, so I was able to just like fidget while I waited. It's kind of cool to do this from home. <laughs> Good. Well, uh, so, thank you. Senator Breen, Representative Pierce, Senator Daughtry, Representative Brennan, and members of the Committees on Appropriations and Financial Affairs and Education and Cultural Affairs. My name is Katrina Ray Salas. I live in Augusta. I currently teach at Central Maine Community College and at Kennebec Valley Community College. And I'm here to, on my own time to testify in support of the cultural agencies and higher education section of LD 221, 
but also to advocate for increased funding to the Maine Community College system in the biennial budget. I am personal proof of the benefits the Maine Community College system has on the quality of life for people in this great state. I grew up below the poverty line, living on food stamps and wearing donated winter coats in the Western Maine mountains. In my mid twenties, I made the decision that I didn't want to work retail jobs forever. And I applied to CMCC, a decision I have never regretted. I went from an associate's degree at CMCC onto a bachelor's degree and then just this last winter, I earned my master's degree through USM. Going to community college changed my life in myriad ways, but I'm still nervous about my financial future. I invested a lot of money in my education. I took out student loans that I will be paying for years to come. And my goal is to work one day full time in the community colleges that did so much for me. However, as time goes on, it becomes more and more apparent that those full-time positions are disappearing due to the lack of funding. I'm losing hope and seeing a return on my financial investment into my education. I love teaching and there's nothing I would rather do. And I truly love teaching in the community college setting. The students are ambitious, they are diverse, and they are changing their world and ours in some really beautiful ways. They are amazing people who deserve being at my best but I fear that the stress I'm under due to the lack of job security and low wages means they aren't always getting me at my best. I piece together full-time work by filling my empty hours with freelance writing. And prior to the pandemic, I also worked as a nanny. Sometimes I tutor, I do a lot of things. Just thinking about my schedule is exhausting, but I'm going to, but I'm doing what I have to do to get by in academia because I love teaching. Adjunct positions were meant to be the exception, not the rule. And yes, some adjuncts are retired professionals who want to share their knowledge or people working in the field who wish to teach a class here and there. But with a lack of other options, adjunct positions have also become the only valid career path for so many of us. And during this pandemic, we've seen firsthand the dangers this system has for us. Many of my colleagues and I myself have lost work because of low enrollment numbers, the same ones President Daigler mentioned earlier. While full-time faculty are guaranteed a certain number of courses each semester, adjuncts have no such guarantee, and we can lose income that we are relying on with a minimum of just a few days notice. And honestly, the accepted reality by many adjuncts who do wish to teach full-time is that those positions are no longer available to us. Some of my colleagues have been adjuncts for a decade or more and want to teach full-time, but have given up on that being a possibility. I, like many adjuncts, struggle to make a livable income. If you calculate my time outside the classroom doing prep work and grading, I basically am working for minimum wage. I pay for health insurance out of my own pocket, which means high deductibles I can't afford. I work multiple jobs to keep my, keep my household afloat and I rarely take days off. I also don't have any guaranteed pay during summer break vacation when the schools aren't in session. I'm really passionate about the subjects I teach and about teaching, but my potential is being held back. We frequently talk about how we should be working to keep younger people here in the state. And through the community college system, we have an opportunity to not only train students for their careers, but to also create stable jobs for people like me who want to teach in Maine's colleges and deserve job security. People like me who want to buy houses, raise children and stay here in Maine. We need to pay adjuncts a proper wage and we need to ensure that full-time positions within the Maine community college system are not only protected, but expanded. This pandemic has taught us so much about our education system. And for me, it has made it increasingly clear that community colleges are an essential service to make residents and that the adjunct teachers who are the backbone of that system deserve security. While funding appears to be flat in this budget for MCCS, I would suggest instead providing additional funding for the MCCS system in the biennial budget. This would be an important step toward providing adjuncts with job security healthcare and career paths. It is also critical for ensuring that the Maine Community College system can be competitive in hiring the best employees. Maine's adjunct instructors value Maine's educational institutions, and we are asking you to show us that you value us as well. Throughout this pandemic, we have adjusted and adapted to the many changes being thrown our way and have continued to deliver quality education to Mainers despite these, cur these curveballs. Many of the challenges we are facing require funding to address. And since raising tuition is not the ideal way to guarantee that funding, especially during a pandemic, 
I'm here to ask you to allocate, allocate additional funding in the biennial budget. Thank you for your time and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Ray Salas. Did you tell us what you teach, what your subject area is? Uh, no, I teach English primarily and I also teach women's studies. Great. Although I've been thrown into many a different course when somebody was needed in a place. <laughs> Any questions um, for Ms. Ray Salas? Am I saying that correctly? Yes. Great. From either committee? Not, not seeing any. So um, again, I wanna thank you for waiting and thank you for hanging in there and, and coming and talking with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Mitch Sanborn. Um, I'm going to move him over now into the panel. So he, if he could give us a shout when he arrives, that would be great. Hi, can you hear me? I can hear you. I, I have audio only. I don't have a- How's that? Wonderful, thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, Senators Breen, Daughtry, Representatives Purse, Brennan, and distinguished members of the Joint Standing Committees on Appropriations and Financial Affairs and Education and Cultural Affairs. My name is Elliot Mitchell Sanborn. My friends and colleagues call me Mitch. I'm here today to speak on behalf of my employer, Intercon Technologies, as well as many other local businesses who benefited from working with the Maine public universities in support of the funding in the state budget for the University of Maine system, including its research, development, and commercialization capacity. I'm a lifelong resident of Maine. I attended college at Southern Maine Community College, as well as University of Southern Maine. The programs I took at USM uh, were instrumental in me achieving several of my career goals specifically in the areas of lean manufacturing and leadership. My professional career began about 30 years ago when I was a tool and die maker at Nichols Portland. In 1999, my career took me to Lanco Integrated, a Westbrook-based company that specializes in the designing and manufacturing of custom automated assembly machines. At Lanco, I pursued a new path as a design engineer. During my 20-year tenure at Lanco, I held many positions ranging from project engineer, project manager, and manufacturing manager. During this period, I received professional certifications from USM for leadership, supervision, Lean Six Sigma Green Belt, as well as Lean Six Sigma Black Belt. During my time at Lanco as Lanco's manufacturing manager, I began collaborating with John Belding, the Advanced Manufacturing Center Director at University of Maine at Orono. John, as well as his staff of professional engineers, and engineering students worked with me on several projects, primarily supporting the design and build of custom automated assembly equipment of various industries. This partnership allowed Lanco to secure these projects, which may have been supported elsewhere, if not for their support. Last March, I joined the Enercon team as their manager of process engineering. Enercon Technologies is a fully integrated design and build center for electronic instrumentation specializing in medical devices, life science, military, and industrial instrumentation. In the simplest terms, we take an idea from our customers, sometimes drawn on a napkin, design that product, and then we put that into production here at our facility in Gray. Anacon is privately owned, which was founded about 40 years ago, and we currently employ nearly 300 people. On my very first day at Anacon, we had a company meeting where our general manager, Ryan Marcotte explained to the employees what our role would be against the fight against the coronavirus. Our customers' products are being used in the front lines of the pandemic battle, and the need for a significant increase of the volumes of these products was required. To support this need, my role was to work with the Enicon team and, per our motto, do whatever it takes to meet this need. I designed to integrate several automated systems to assist our production teams in meeting these goals. This included onboarding several collaborative robots, which were used to test and part handling some of these components that go into the devices. 
It was at this point that I reached back out to the Advanced Manufacturing Center at University of Maine to help us with this challenge. John and his team did not hesitate. Their task would be to design and manufacture custom tray handling systems that the robots would be interacting with. These systems would be one of many systems needed to help our customers' product be deployed for fighting COVID-19. Our partnership with the university gave me the confidence we would be able to meet our customers' production requirements. This in turn made us able to hire a significant number of new employees at a time when many Mainers were losing their job. We are still hiring today. Had it not been for the commitment and collaboration of the Enercon team and the team at university, our customers may have been forced to seek assistance from other manufacturers outside of the state of Maine. Anacon is just one of hundreds of Maine companies and small businesses that depend on the expertise and equipment available at the University of Maine and other universities within the University of Maine system. As well, the workforce they prepare and we in turn hire are very important to us. We know state funding is critical to the university's ability to meet our needs to grow our businesses in the overall economy, and we hope that you continue to provide them the support. Thank you, and I look forward to answering any questions you might have. Thank you so much, Mr. Sanborn. We really appreciate it. You're um, welcome. Looks like we have a couple of folks from uh, the committee who might have some questions for you. Excellent. Um, Ms., uh, Representative Corey and then Representative Arada. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my wife got a degree a few years ago in manufacturing systems or master's degree in, in manufacturing systems from the University of Southern Maine. Do you know if they still have that degree program there? I'm not 100% uh, certain if they do. Um, most of the applicants that we're hiring um, are typically bachelors. Um, you know, we, we've hired several uh, people from, you know, whether it's University of Maine, University of Maine, Orno, uh, USM. Um, I'm not sure about the master's program. Yeah, that program included a lot of those programs you were talking about, like Six Sigma and Lean. And but okay, cool. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, another question coming from a committee member, uh, Representative Arada. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yes, Intercon is right next door to me. I'm in New Gloucester, so excellent hello, neighbor. Um, I was wondering, um, in light of the university and um, community college system being mostly online right now, um, do you have any concerns that they're gonna come out with um, needing additional training that they might not normally need from your company? Or, or do, you, do you think that that online education that they're getting, especially in technical areas, it will be adequate? Um, no, I do not feel it's gonna be adequate. Um, you know, working with the Advanced Manufacturing Center uh, up to Orono, and I've also worked uh, with University of Southern Maine um, in some of their robotics classes. Uh, the hands-on lab are you know, truly instrumental in getting the students prepared. Um, we do offer internships uh, here. Um, we've been one of the, the lucky companies that have stayed open uh, during the pandemic. Um, we immediately brought on uh, two interns uh, to help us out, both from the University of Maine Orno. Um, but yeah, I mean, long-term, I, I really think the having the laboratories, having the facilities and actually you know, getting that hands-on experience is, is truly critical them to become you know, good employees once they graduate. Okay, that's good to know, thank you. You're welcome, thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Sanborn? Uh, not seeing any. Um, I wanna thank you again uh, for hanging in there with us. Thank you for your patience and making yourself available today. We really appreciate it. Yes, thank you, Senator Ring. All righty. Um, Next, and I believe last, is uh, Monique Belisle. Uh, she has also been waiting a long time, so I'm going to move Monique over to um, the panel and ask her the same thing to give us a little holler when you get here so we can find your square. I see a square. Oh, there she is. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Um, Senators Spreen and Daughtry, Representatives Purse and Brennan, and distinguished members of the Committees on Appropriations and Financial Affairs and Education and Cultural Affairs, good afternoon. My name is Monique Belial, and I live in Winslow. I am a nursing student at the University of Southern Maine, minoring in Leadership Studies. 
with appreciation for the tremendous opportunities that have been afforded to me by USM, I am here today to encourage your continued support for the University of Maine system. I'm a first generation college student. My father never completed his high school education until the age of 48, and my mother had to work multiple jobs just to make ends meet. This was a cycle that I sought to break when I had children of my own, of which I now have three. I enrolled in community college in the fall of 2018 and successfully completed my associate's degree in nursing, subsequently obtaining licensure as a registered nurse last May. While I was able to acquire skills and training through the community college system, I quickly came to the realization that I was still limited in my ability to achieve my goals unless I continued to further my education. The COVID-19 pandemic certainly exemplified this as an entry level public health nursing position requires either a BSN or a cumulative number of credit hours in community health, neither of which did I have. So upon graduation, I transferred to USM for an accelerated program that allows RNs to quickly attain a highly sought after Bachelor of Science in nursing degree. I was drawn to USM because of the extensive advancement opportunities that they provided, the high quality of instruction, and most importantly, the affordability. As a working mother and primary provider for my family, cost was the deciding factor in whether or not I could continue my education. Since enrolling at USM, they have provided me with the resources not only to succeed academically, but personally as well. I began working as a registered nurse at Maine General in Augusta, and this opportunity to earn a living while also earning my degree would not have been possible without the flexibility and cognizant planning of the coursework by USM faculty and staff with the needs of all learners, including adults like me, in mind. The barriers to education that have been created by COVID are a plenty, but creative adaptations were implemented and even the clinical components of our program were able to be completed without disruption. Instructors utilized technology and multimedia platforms and continued to hold live online classes, keeping students engaged, connected, safe, and on track for our future. It is my ultimate goal and aspiration to improve the lives of those around me and the health and well being of Maine's communities. This has already begun through opportunities at USM, such as volunteer vaccination clinics and community health partnerships that myself and nursing classmates are eager to engage in. So as I approach the completion of my bachelor's degree this December, I will apply to USM's nurse practitioner graduate program with confidence, thanks to the high quality education and training that I have received here at the university so far. I will become a role model for my children and an example that their dreams too are within reach. I'll be better prepared to serve Maine's people with confidence and skill. Investing in education is an upstream approach with extraordinary downstream effects. So thank you for investing in me and in the countless others whose lives have been transformed by the opportunities provided by Maine's public universities. It's been an honor to share my testimony with you and I would welcome any questions you may have. Thank you so much, Ms. Belisle, for uh, hanging in there um, and sharing your story with us. It looks like uh, Representative Salisbury has a question for you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I don't have a question. I just wanted to give Ms. Belisle a virtual high five. <sighs> Nicely done and congratulations you. on your success and you keep that up. That's fantastic. Good for you. Thank you. I think Representative Salisbury uh, captured a lot of our sentiments. Any questions um, for Ms. Belisle from any committee members? Well, given all that you're, that's all on your plate, your family, your studies and everything, um, we really, really appreciate you making the time today to join us and thank you very, very much. It was a pleasure, thank you.
All right. Um, so that is the end of um, members that we have for public testimony. Um, so um, I'm just gonna ask um, our analysts to come on. And before I let uh, education committee folks go, ask Maureen to come on and see if there is um, anything we have yet to do today as a joint committee. Well, I think you have completed your work for the day as far as I can see. So you're Great. all free to go. All right. So uh, thanks again to education members. Great to see you. Uh, we look forward to your report back. I think, I bet you my good co-chair knows exactly when that's due. Would you like to share that with us? It's Tuesday, March 16th. All right. Uh, we look forward to that. Thank you for the work on the supplemental that you've already done. And um, we uh, wish you all a good evening and thanks for coming. And um, appropriations members, I would say the same to you. Uh, we will gather again uh, tomorrow, I believe at 10 a.m. Um, for what committee do we have with us tomorrow, Representative Purse? Uh, we have two committees. IDEA is in the afternoon and the morning is EUT. Energy, Utilities and Technology. We have a full day starting at 10 and then again at one. Great. Uh, any questions? Well, let me just say uh, the public hearing is adjourned, so folks can sign up.